hopefully are working. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Just to stay on track of the program, um, I suggest we begin. Not sure everybody's here yet, but um, they've been given the time. Um, so, good morning. Um, we're here in a session to talk about uh, transformative change and meaningful action. Um, that is part of the um, connection uh, strand and is specifically addressing inclusion. Um, and we'll be speaking about the Scottish Government's acceptance of the Empire Slavery and Scotland's Museum report and recommendations. Um, and we will be looking at the way um, we are shaping a response to that and how we are progressing the work that is set out in the ESSM report. Um, I'm Stef Scholten. I'm in daily life the Dutch director of the Hunterian, um, but I'm also a board member of MGS and a member of the steering group that worked on the ESSM report and recommendations. Um, I'm a white middle-aged man, cis, I would say, wearing the uniform of white middle-aged men, which is dark blue suit. Um, and um, it is my pleasure to chair this panel that has the following speakers. Um, they're at the table. Sheila Sante, the program manager for Delivering Change at MGS. Um, Melina Valdevier, senior education officer at Education Scotland. And Eli Muniandi, uh, who is equality, diversity and inclusion officer at the National Library of Scotland. They'll be um, giving some so short introductions after me. But let me start saying um, a few words um, about the ESSM uh, project. You can see the members of the steering group on the slide. There they are. I need to speak about Slido, don't I do? Don't I have to do that first? Maybe we go one back. So the, um, you can put your questions into Slido. I don't know if you've, we've used it before at MGS events. You can scan the QR code. You need to enter that code, um, that is 29281827, to get to the right um, box where your um, um, questions will pop up. And um, after I have short presentations, we will go into a Q&A right away. Um, if there's any more questions, Gillian is the expert on the front row there. Um, so um, if we move on we can to the first slide. So these are the members of this steering group that worked on the ESSM report and uh, recommendations, um, um, chaired by Jeff Palmer, who has since stepped back. Um, and uh, some of uh, the members of this group are actually in the room. Um, Abir Elenadi is there, and Elena uh, Trimarki is there. Um, and Parveen um, Isvak was going to be there. I haven't seen her yet. Um, and of course, she, Sheila was our project uh, manager for the project. Um, I think this is all great, but I think we need to acknowledge that um, the ESSM report only came about because of decades of work by grassroots organizations and activists that have made the case for the acknowledgement of Scotland's connection to slavery and empire and its impacts on present day society in all relevant ways. Scotland's museums and heritage institutions are of particular importance as places where Scottish histories and identities are being presented and celebrated. Museums have tended to do so without acknowledging the more painful and difficult sides of Scotland's participation in the Empire Project and its dehumanizing practices, especially chattel slavery and other forms of colonial violence. I can slot in Dutch where it says uh, Scottish um, and we will have exactly the same and right meaning to this, uh, uh, this introduction. Um, and I've realized and come to realize over the last few years that it's not necessarily easy for museum professionals such as myself to change our practice in fundamental ways. By fully including the people affected by these histories and their stories into our spaces and ways of working and reshaping many aspects of our work. But it's something that we need to do if we want to be and remain relevant for the people in Scotland, for all people in Scotland. And this is not a project. This is generational work for our whole sector and for Scottish society. Um, the second slide shows um, um, 
an event um, at the end of January at my museum at the Hunterian where uh, Minister McKelvey uh, came to accept um, um, the um, uh, recommendations uh, on behalf of Scottish Government. Uh, taken a little while, about a year and a half to get there, but we, we got there in the end. And interestingly enough, um, Kalkup Stewart, the new minister, was also there. Um, so there was a lucky coincidence. Um, and you can see the six um, recommendations of, um, um, of the SSM on the screen here, and I run through them very quickly. Um, first recommendation is around creating a dedicated space to address, address Scotland's role in empire, colonialism, and historic slavery. And, we, and we've said, um, as an ESSM steering group, that a new organization should be created to lead this work. Um, museums should ensure anti-racism is embedded in their workplaces and public spaces. Museums should involve the people of Scotland in shaping their work through co-production to promote cultural democracy and participation for all. Museums should commit to research, interpret, and share the histories of Scotland's link links to empire, colonialism, and historic slavery. And museums should support to promote and embed race equality and anti-racism in the curricula in a meaningful, effective, and sustainable way. Last, um, Scottish Government should demonstrate their support for restitution and repatriation of looted and unethically acquired items in Scottish collections. Um, all six uh, recommendations have been accepted by Scottish Government um, and we'll update you on the current state of affairs. Um, the implementation of the um, ESSM recommendations is an important contribution to the inclusion strand of Scotland's museums and galleries uh, strategy, which aims to achieve that museums and galleries across Scotland, this is a quote, with a diverse range of people to support them to tell their stories, creating an environment where all people feel safe, welcome, and engaged. And actions in the MGS strategy, or I must say, sorry, the, museum, the Scottish Museum uh, strategy, um, have been specified for the sector to conduct research to understand the demographics of who is currently accessing museums and to understand underrepresentation in current users. We need to develop engaging and accessible programming that responds to the needs of all people, prioritizing engagement with those who have been excluded from our services and seeking to be sensitively co-create opportunities for engagement. We need to embed anti-racist, anti-ableist, and inclusive values within organizational cultures and programs. And the um, actions of MDS are to support the sector in doing that, to develop training, to support museums, to embrace organizational change, to support understanding and practicing key areas, including anti-racism, human rights-based approaches, and participatory practice. We share advice on how to seek and share collections knowledge and how to work with communities of origin in sharing their histories. Support understanding of how museums work in a global context, learning from good practice in understanding and protecting culture and decolonizing work in museums. I will briefly speak, really briefly speak to recommendations one and six um, uh, before handing over to the, uh, my fellow pan panelists who will speak approximately five to six minutes. Um, about the uh, recommendations that have, they've been working on. Um, recommendation one was about that dedicated space, maybe um, the most pronounced recommendation um, in, in, in a number of ways because it um, becomes so easily politicized. Um, and we've said that a new organization, a black-led um, new organization, should be created to lead this work. And a smaller group of group of ex uh, steering group members have volunteered to form um, the founding group that will set up this new organization. Um, and we have a first proper meeting set up uh, two weeks from now. Um, the group will be chaired by Yatin Haria, who is in daily life the director of the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. Um, and the group will aim to set up a legal entity and it will recruit more board members so that a full set of necessary competencies are covered. And the group will recruit, depending on Scottish Government and other funding uh, decisions. Um, there's now, at this point, only £100,000 committed. 
um, we will um, uh, look to recruit at least one staff member to get things up and running. And as you can imagine, the actual dedicated space may be a little, uh, a, a little bit away still. Um, recommendation six is on repatriation. Um, and the implementation of this recommendation will start shortly by bringing people together from the sector uh, to scope what possible Scottish repatriation guidance could entail. There's, of course, excellent practice in Scotland and numerous examples of policies, procedures, guidelines, and actual repatriations to take on board. And many, if not um, um, all, Scottish organizations have, um, that have recently been involved in repatriations have been um, invited to join that scoping exercise. Um, if any of you here are interested in uh, this, please speak to MGS staff, and I refer again to Gillian Simpson, maybe. Um, 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 uh, to see um, if, you, um, if you have interest to join a meeting that will be held on 11 March, if I'm correct. Um, so that was me. And now turn to Sheila Santa, the program manager for the Delivering Change um, at Museum Gallery Scotland and previously the manager of the ESSM project to speak about how Delivering Change addresses recommendations two, three, and four of the ESSM report. Sheila. Yes. Oh. Can, can you hear me? Great. So hi, yes, I'm Sheila Asante, um, and my pronouns are she, her. And as a visual description, I'm a mixed race brown woman with quite a large afro today. Um, I'm wearing glasses, um, and I've got a flowery, very colorful shirt with the branding color of yellow in there for my delivering change. As you can see, <laughs> it is no way my favorite color. <laughs> um, so. Um, as mentioned, I um, am now currently the um, program manager for the Delivering Change project, and I'll speak a little bit more about that um, and, in, as we go on. And I was um, the um, project manager for the steering group um, to deliver the um, ESSM recommendations. So um, as um, Steph said, um, the pro program I'm working on now is kind of really focusing on recommendations two, three, and four. And I won't go over those um, as Steph has already um, spoken about them, but it's kind of really just kind of embedding that anti-racism, understanding what cultural democracy looks like in the sector and ensuring that that um, is then actually spread across the work that um, visitors will see. So Delivering Change itself, um, it was a programme that came out of a lot of the research and consultation from the ESSM project and that directly led to the development of the programme. Um, and thanks to the support of the Scottish Government and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we've created a three-year programme uh, of learning, leadership and funding. So it's designed to be flexible and enable museums to place people at the heart of their work. It's um, going to be developed, um, at, well, has been and is current, continually being developed um, with the support of an expert advisory group and to um, Melina and Elia, both on our advisory group as well. Um, and as with the SSM, um, we're taking a human rights based approach to the programme and the development and delivery to make sure it's informed by the lived and professional experience of those who have experienced systemic exclusion. And I'll go on to explain some of the language that um, we use as well as we go through the pro presentation. So um, at its core, um, we are aiming to uh, learn from what has often been a tokenistic approach um, in previous programmes and create something that will really embed um, organisational change um, within the sector. So as I mentioned, language is key um, and for delivering change, it's really, really important. Um, we want to support um, that work in understanding the language um, and understanding the language we use and the, uh, the language around inclusion. Um, but for delivering change, we have um, specifically wanted to use language that acknowledges systemic exclusion. And for us, um, it's really important that the patterns of exclusion are, are highlighted and not seen as merely a coincidence. So for us, systemic exclusion is when groups of people are intentionally disadvantaged by economic, social, political and cultural systems based on their identity while advantaging members of the dominant group for example, in terms of gender, race, class, sexual orientation, and language, and others. 
So we also want to acknowledge that there are multiple oppressions that people face at the same time. So rather than using segregating language, we really want to understand those multiple barriers and multiple exclusions for those um, wanting to access and be part of um, heritage and museums. But delivering change, um, it's not for us about more work, but more about working differently. So as I say, we had extensive research and consultation from um, the ESSM and then building on the um, other research and consultations that have happened in this area across the sector and for other connected sectors. And building on that, we developed the programme. However, this is really going to be a combined effort um, to remove the barriers and to support each other to be part of the change. And MGS is very much part of that combined effort and we'll be partnering with the museums and galleries and the communities to develop um, that space, that inclusive space together. We want to build relationships based on solidarity with systemically excluded communities, and we want to restructure as organisations based on anti-oppressive principles. So by the end of Delivering Change, um, which will um, be finishing in 2026-2027, um, we, want to, we aim to have 16 museum transformers and they will be going through a programme of organisational change and we're looking to have um, those museums who are applying um, and the applications are closing on the 11th of March, so get your application in. Um, but the, what we're looking for there is organisational change taking um, across um, an organisation's hierarchy to work to embed an understanding of anti-oppression, in particular anti-racism and anti-ableism across that organisation, as I say, to embed it and um, hopefully take on the challenge of that, those, the often tokenistic approaches. We'll also have 200 museum activists. So those are um, individuals who would like to take part. Maybe their organisation um, hasn't applied or is not able to at this current time, um, but they would still like to take part. So we're really encouraging um, others who would like to continue that work and to support themselves on that work. Um, so there'll be 200 museum activists um, as well that can, to, can join up. Um, and th at the end of that, they will hopefully be at le the leaders in anti-oppression and human rights in museums. And then we're also um, going to be signing up shortly um, community catalysts for our community catalyst programme. And the community catalyst programme is looking to, to flip a lot of the power dynamic on its head. We're going to be funding directly community organisations. They will have the idea and then they will partner with one of the 60 museum transformers with their idea and then partner together to develop it more fully. But it's their idea and they should also hold the funding. So this just slide wants to just give a few examples of some of the places that um, we have funded since uh, 2019. That we've invested in MGS nearly 750,000 to support museums across the, um, the country doing this work. And you probably recognise many of the places. Um, there's the Hunterian, um, as Steph is mentioning, with Curating Discomfort, Kelvin Grove, um, and the work of the Museum of Empire. Um, and then the redevelopment of the David Livingston birthplace are some examples of um, some work that, a lot of the work that's happening across the sector and that has been funded um, that we are con and we continue to want to support through delivering change and also our other funding. So I invite you to be part of the change. Um, we are hoping to yeah, develop that sector that will be truly inclusive, trusted and engaged with by all of Scotland's people. Um, so yeah, please hopefully join us. Okay. Ellie goes first. Yeah. And um, um, she will be speaking about the very important uh, subject of inclusive staff recruitment and retention. Um, Ellie. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name's Ellie Miniandi. Um, I use she, they pronouns. Visual description, I have short brown hair. Um, I am a mixed race brown person um, and I'm wearing a black top. Um, so yeah, the work that I'm going to be talking about today that I've been doing at the library is really speaking to the um, second recommendation about embedding anti-racism in the, the workplace um, and um, within staff, within organisations. So I... Uh, <coughs> sorry. It's going to work, yeah. Um, so... I've been working, so I got a pot of funding from the Heritage Innovation Fund, which is a new fund, and it was specifically um, put to help organizations around um, issues around workforce. Um, so the, the pitch that I put 
um, to them was really around um, the diversity of our workforce because we know at the library it's it's not great and that is true of a lot of other people in the sector and other organizations as well so so this was the first stage was the um, explore phase um, and this was really looking at um, what what other what good practice was already going on in other organizations um, what was and also looking at my own organization and figuring out what was working what wasn't working so well um, so it was a piece of research um, over six months um, and that the the kind of results of that were really that um, there we know that there's there's a lot of um, published reports and things like that that tell us about the lack of workforce diversity but in terms of the why um, it was really you know what we what we saw from from the investigation was managers lacked confidence um, to be able to manage marginalized people and diverse teams um, so this was both from organizations themselves realizing this but actually much more so from marginalized people that I spoke to and and kind of saying you know I'm not really able to talk to my manager I don't feel comfortable talking to my manager they're not really aware of these issues they've never brought them up before um, so I don't you know I don't know if I'm able to talk about them so there were a real kind of lack of trust in um, employees being able to speak to their managers about issues around diversity um, there was also a lack of commitment and support from senior leadership. So generally across the sector, what the reasons why things weren't changing was because there wasn't that kind of buy-in from, from senior leadership, which we know, you know, in all sorts of areas, we know how important that is um, to make change. Um, the processes and procedures implemented um, without corresponding culture change. So this is, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, technical changes, a lot of changes to recruitment practices, um, but not necessarily the, the kind of work at a culture change level for an organization um, to ensure that this was, um, that the practice and um, kind of beliefs and behaviors and values of the, of the people working there were also changing in line with the kind of technical changes to, um, to recruitment practices. Um, and the workforce um, in the wider heritage sector um, does not reflect the diversity of the public that it serves. Um, so that was what I found in the explore phase. Um, and so that took us on to the test phase, um, which is what I'm in now. And the test phase, the, we, had to cut, we had to talk through a, a theory of change um, around what we were using in order to um, inform what our test phase project was going to be. Um, and so I've been using the um, adaptive uh, leadership model. So that sense of it's not just the technical changes to policies and procedures, but also that culture change and thinking about that um, at different levels of the organization and what is needed for those different levels within an organization in order for that change to, to be embedded. Um, so I'm now in the test phase. So the test phase project um, has various different streams. Um, so we're trying to tackle um, all the different layers of the organization. So we have a stream that's um, working with um, our senior leadership team. Um, and I'm very, very pleased we've got um, Rayanne King, who's here today. So thank you to Rayanne, um, who's been working with our leadership team. So doing consultancy and coaching with them around EDI leadership. And what does that look like? both thinking about their everyday practices um, as senior leaders and what being role models um, in an organization looks like, but also um, in terms of our new strategy, because we're looking at our 2025 to 2030 um, uh, library strategy. So she's been working with them in order to uh, consider EDI and look at how, how that gets embedded within, within the strategy as well as in their kind of roles um, as leaders. Um, so that's what the first kind of stream the second stream is the management stream so this is working with um we've chosen kind of senior managers so heads of um within the organization to do some specific edi training so um looking when i say edi I mean anti-oppression. The EDI is the word that the library uses, but I, I think of it in terms of anti-oppression work, just um, FYI. Uh, so yeah, so that training is um, 
having so the organization when I first started um, I did a basic EDI training that was compulsory for all members of staff so they have a, a baseline training um, but for the managers I'm doing um, an in-depth training around specifically LGBT um, race disability and gender um, and so they're getting an in-depth training around those areas and on top of that there's also reflective sessions so not just giving them information but also giving them a chance to process that information and reflect on their roles as managers and again as leaders within the organization and how they can how how what they've learned about the structure and systems of oppression that that people marginalized people experience and also what that looks like in a kind of day-to-day -day, um, within organizational settings how that then informs their practice as managers um, so that's the so it's yeah yeah, it's both the training but also the reflective sessions in order to um, give them an opportunity to think about how their practice can change over time. So that's that and then there's also um, a section around HR because obviously you know what we're talking about with workforce is human resources or, or kind of people and culture whatever it, it, the title is in, in the organizations at the moment um, but again giving them specialist training around um, the, the same um, EDI topics um, in order for them to be able to uh, give give better advice feel more confident um, at being at talking to managers and advising managers but also to build up the um, trust for employees to be able to come and speak to um, the HR um, like partners in a, in a meaningful way um, so there's a whole um, bunch of work within this and this is at it, the key is that it's a test phase so the idea is that we're testing out this model we're testing out um, what works what doesn't work within the organization the fund itself has a grow phase as well attached to it so that is very much looking at the sector the heritage sector more widely um, so that is what we will move on to um, potentially uh, depending if my role gets kept um, <laughs> but so that would be taking that what we've learned in the test phase and taking it out to the wider heritage sector so there is already a bit so the work I'm doing in terms of the HR training I'm not just doing that within the library I'm doing that within the whole um, or offering that out to the wider heritage sector um, so if any organizations want their HR folk to um, get some in-depth EDI training then let me know and I can um, I can see if that's if that's going to work. Um, so yeah, the it's so the point of of this project really is to um, to create um, to create conditions that better support the and retain marginalised workers. Because even though this is started off really talking about recruitment, actually for me, I think retention is is really underrated and not looked at enough. And again, it's that culture change work that's necessary. So developing that the managerial confidence and attitudes and awareness and skills in order for them to be able to to support marginalized people and not only to support marginalized people that they are managing, but also to challenge um, staff that they might be managing when they there are microaggressions when there are problems, um, problematic behavior around those topics. So it's on, on both sides of that. So that is, that is a specific um, funding project that uh, I'm working on. But on top of that, you know, connected to all of that, where I've also been looking at values and behaviors. Um, so this is, um, an, again, a part of that big culture change that we're doing um, at the library. Um, we're looking at um, our code of conduct um, and making changes to our code of conduct because it's very old and very kind of civil servant, you know, um, kind of style. Um, so this we did a big consultation at the end of last year where we invited everyone in the organization to come and have a conversation both about our organizational values um, the ones that we currently have so this was partly to help again inform the new strategy but also for us to be able to have a conversation with staff about how um, what their experience of working at the library was like what did they see in terms of the values the behaviors or the characteristics in terms of 
the, the culture of the organization. So, we, so the first part was looking at values and the second part was then looking at the code of conduct. What did they want to see in the code of conduct? But also then what, did, what do we do when, when things go wrong? Um, so this was really an opportunity for people to not only think about what is it like to work here, what is the culture, but also what changes do, do we need and what do people need, in, you know, if, if someone did break the code of conduct, why wouldn't someone report that, for example? Like, what would be the barriers and what could, what could be put in place to help overcome those barriers? So really, I mean, I saw it as a very kind of co-production co piece, you know, working really closely with our staff to say, what do you need in order, if someone, you know, behaves disrespectfully, what do you need in order to, um, to be able to have a conversation with them or to report that to higher up, depending on the, the nature of the, of the the break. So, yeah, I think this has been this is going to be really, really important in terms of building up that trust with the with employees as well. In terms of the trust that the organisation is going to to take their um, their experience seriously, um, to make change to the the culture, and to be able to support them if things um, if things do go wrong. Um, so I think that was all I had to say about the work I've been doing. As you can see, it's very much in progress. Yeah, we're testing things out. We're going to see how it goes. But I think it's, uh, yeah, I'm really excited at the possibility of taking some of this work into the wider sector more generally um, later on. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ellie, for sharing your, uh, your work. Uh, um, and now, Melina Valdelievre. I shall pronounce it properly this time. I apologize for the first time. Um, education. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Melina Valdelievre. Um, I use the she, her, or they, them pronouns. And my visual description, um, so I'm a mixed race brown woman, Franco-Indian, in my early 30s. I'm wearing glasses, uh, black hair tied up in a ponytail, um, and a dark green kurta, sort of Indian long shirt. Um, so yeah, t I'm going to be talking to you about anti-racist education, so what's happening in the education sector. I work for Education Scotland, my background is in teaching, um, but I was really excited to see the uh, recommendation from the ESSM uh, project around education, so museum supporting anti-racist education. So I'm going to give you a bit of background around some of the work that's going on in the education sector. Um, and so I suppose, oops, sorry, there we go. So um, we have a national program of anti-racism uh, anti in education that was uh, started off with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020 with the death of George Floyd, when um, uh, lots of children and young people were starting petitions, writing to ministers, asking for change, asking for black history to be taught, asking for anti-racism to be taught. And as a result of that, uh, the ministers who had a meeting with some young people decided to set up this new program of work. So after engagement with a range of stakeholders, community members, teachers, um, trade unions, and so on, uh, we set up this anti-racism in education program to, run by um, the Scottish government. We have four different work streams and a program board. Uh, I am a part of the program board and a few of these work streams, so I'll tell you a bit about each one. Um, so the first one looks at education, leadership and professional learning. That focuses a lot on um, actually how confident are teachers in, uh, first of all, talking about race, talking about um, Scotland's history and role in transatlantic enslavement, for example, talking and dealing with racist incidents, addressing those, supporting children and young people. Um, and so that's where, with funding, we developed the Building Racial Literacy Program, which is an anti-racist professional learning program um, that I uh, led on for a year and a half. And that has now had four cohorts of over 400 teachers and educators across Scotland have experienced the program and gone on to either um, start their own anti-racist actions with um, the curriculum they were developing or um, also thinking about new uh, collaboration and professional learning for others. So um, lots of exciting work going on there. We also have a work stream looking at uh, diversity in the teaching profession and educational workforce. And I was delighted to hear all the work that Ellie's been doing because 
there's so many connections there, so I'll be speaking to you later again. Um, essentially, in the teaching profession, we only have 1.8% of black and minority ethnic um, teachers in Scotland, that was in 2023. The Scottish government has accepted to uh, raise that by four, so increase it to 4% by 2030. Um, and that was based on census data from 2011 to reflect Scottish population. Uh, we also have a national anti-racism framework for ITE, initial teacher education. So every um, institution that uh, trains teachers, future teachers, has agreed to follow this framework and has um, um, nominated members working on these, on the implementation of this framework. So we're hoping that future teachers that come into the profession will um, definitely be more, more confident and equipped to um, engage in anti-racist education. We also have a work stream looking at racist incidents, looking at how to deal with that in a whole school approach. And last but not least, um, I co-chair the curriculum reform work stream, which uh, developed the uh, breaking the mold principles for an anti-racist curriculum. Really excited to share these with you um, on the next slide. So essentially these anti-racist curriculum principles were developed, I think about a year and a half ago now. Um, they were co-designed with a range of uh, community activists, educators, um, and also a member of Scottish Youth Parliament who identified as a young black person. Who he, he coined the title Breaking the Mould because his um, experiences of the curriculum in Scotland were very narrow. He said he, would, he felt he had to kind of repress a lot of his different identities to fit this very narrow frame. And so an anti-racist curriculum would have to break that mould. He didn't want to be moulded. We shouldn't be moulding people into very specific um, uh, ways. So these principles are very much aspirational. They're broken down into what children and young people should experience in an anti-racist curriculum and then what educators and leaders need to be doing to make that happen. Um, they're there to guide, support and challenge us all. Um, they can be quite scary for a teacher who sees what we need to do, but actually um, it's a useful sort of evaluation tool um, and learning for us to move forward. So I'll give you um, a highlight of some of those and align them to some of the recommendations from the museum's uh, the ESSM recommendations, because I think they work really well together. For, so for example, uh, the recommendation two from the museum sector, which says that anti-racism should be embedded in the workplace. Well, actually we have an anti-racist curriculum principle, which asks educators and leaders to de demonstrate that personal and collective leadership, um, which promotes an anti-racist culture and their, their role in supporting people who experience um, racism. So lots that, that aligns and that supports um, in terms of uh, that, that cultural change that museums and education are working towards. Um, we also have, if we look at the third recommendation, so um, the ESSM recommendation looking at um, that co-production of knowledge, that cultural democracy, that participation, it resonates really well with what we're working on in education around the implementation of UNCRC, that pupil participation, but also the anti-racist curriculum principle 14 there that you've got on this slide, which um, get us educators and leaders to co-design a curriculum. So that, that key word for me, co-design, is really important because we're moving away from that top-down hierarchical way of learning where the teacher just gives information and pupils absorb the information. It's a lot more about um, actively participation, par participating, contributing to the learning, taking learners' lives and experiences as a starting point, so whether that is their, um, where they live and what they see, um, but also sourcing diversity where it's missing. So if we're looking at the lack of minority, of, of diversity of pupils, how do we use maybe museum resources, heritage resources to complement that in the curriculum? We also have a recommendation looking at, um, so if we look at the museum's recommendation around the museum's role in sh researching and sharing history that of uh, Scotland's links to uh, empire, colonialism, and enslavement. We have a curriculum principle for children and young people, um, which aligns perfectly around understanding and inquiring into Scotland's role in historical events, including transatlantic enslavement and colonial histories and its continuing impact today. And we're seeing some really good examples of those happening, um, and I'll talk more about them later. Um, I just wanted to end with uh, the program for government from the Scottish government um, education minister, uh, which basically committed to decolonizing the curriculum and emphasizes that 
Scotland's role in uh, transatlantic enslavement, so it really works well with the fifth recommendation on education. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll stop right here and um, I'll tell you more about that when we go on to questions. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions in the Slido. Um, uh, not easy to answer, I think. Um, so the first uh, question was, are there things that we can do to get buy-in from managers? Our director doesn't think this is relevant. And this, um, um, this was when Sheila was speaking, so the anti-racist work in um, organizations. Um, I don't know, um, one of the things I've been thinking is whether or not in delivering change, you will develop sort of peer groups um, um, where, where I say the early adapters may maybe help the slow responders? Yeah, definitely. I mean, with the Transformers program, um, it's one we really wanted to develop um, a cohort for that and have that space for learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, sharing <coughs> challenges and, in, and creating a safe space to be able to share those challenges. Um, we are in conversations with people who, if, if they're feeling that their organization isn't quite ready, as I say, we have the uh, museum activists, and that one is probably going to have more of a, an emphasis on being able to advocate for this within your organization. Um, a lot of the people who have uh, indicated and are, are, are applying for that are in that space of maybe we are not as an organization ready, or I would like some ideas of how to um, explain and how to work with my um, senior leaders in this. So I think the activist program will be a, a really key space for developing that. Um, I mean, very much when we talk about, um, when we've been talking to transformers um, about um, the potential applications, what they have been saying in terms of how they're talking to their senior, um, depending on if it's um, local authorities and to, um, up to um, uh, minister, ministers, councillors and things, um, is certain things around the um, public sector equalities duties. Um, those, those are duties that people, do, that, that organisations that are publicly funded do have to adhere to, but also um, the new human rights um, bills, as mentioned by Melina uh, as well, but there the, the will be the right to, to culture will be um, part of Scots law shortly and will have its own um, obligations um, again within the public sector. So those are some of the things that we can look at in terms of in reasonings and helping, um, but also I think it's probably going to be that space for the activists to be able to ha share their experiences and help to build that. And then, as you say, the early adopters can be a way for people to, to see the, where their leaders are in that. Mm. The, um, um, yeah, and, and I guess um, there will be, we will be developing large cohorts of people who have gained much more understanding around these uh, topics, so I think that will be important. Um, maybe a question, um, um, the big question is how can we create anti-racist communities? Um, I hear questionable language in my workplace, um, but why the community is a big problem, we get racist uh, comments on socials. I think, I mean, to me, th that's the point of why we're doing all of this, is, you know, is, is in, the, at least, within our sphere of influence that we have as museums, that we have as educators, as, as um, um, is to try to educate people in ways um, so we can move forward um, on this issue. And we know that that is very, very difficult. I think all organizations experience, you know, negative comments on social media if they, if they um, 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 highlight certain uh, um, certain activities. Um, it's very unfortunate. Is, is there, um, I think for me always, I think, you know, schools, education is where it starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of uh, language, um, we often have, um, so participants, educators who complete the Building Racial Literacy Program, they have um, an anti-racist action plan with lots of really exciting ideas um, to try out with their uh, pupils, but a lot of the time they realize actually we need that parental engagement, that support uh, for parents to understand why it's important, um, especially when it comes to words that can be quite intimidating. Even the word anti-racist, uh, maybe two or three years ago, was quite controversial in, Scot in at least Scottish government. We, we always race equality, anti-racist was seen as too 
um, to sort of grassroots and um, to out there, but actually we're now seeing that cultural change slowly coming forward. So it is about giving people time to understand why those words are changing, why some words are no longer acceptable. Um, it can be quite scary for people who have been using words uh, for a very long time and then being told actually that it's, it's not appropriate to use it. And um, yeah, moving away from that sort of pointing fingers at people um, and inviting people in to have those conversations. Um, it's always going to be a challenge when people don't want to listen or aren't ready for that, but creating spaces where that can happen, whether it's in um, schools or in community learning spaces, um, the more spaces we have for those conversations, the easier I think it will get. Maybe there's two questions here that maybe Ali can um, have a quick go at. Um, so one of them is how do we ensure the work we need to do doesn't cause additional trauma to people of color in our organization? The labor of anti-racist work often ends up with these colleagues. And also how to combat the feeling that talking about these things focus on the negativity and shame. That's where resistance um, occurs. Yeah, I mean, in terms of supporting um, marginalized people within organizations, I guess that's where things like having staff equality networks is really helpful um, to create opportunities for people with shared um, characteristics to come together and um, and you know maybe that's vent maybe that's you know talk maybe that's organize um, in terms of making changes to the organization um, but yeah certainly having spaces uh, protected spaces are, are so important um, I know like museum detox is a great um, kind of wider network as well which um, I know lots of people have benefited from um, and feels like really important um, for, for stuff like that. I think, unfortunately, I think the nature of this work, you know, it, it would... People are getting harmed all the time. Um, and so I don't think the attitude is like, we need to make sure then people aren't being harmed because that's just inevitable as as we are going through this change as a society, as a sector, um, as organizations. So um, I think it's, I think, yeah, it's so, it's such an interesting area. You know, the one of like well-being, employee well-being, what does that look like? I know like um, the uh, National Museums Liverpool have got specifically black therapists, for example, to come and work with the their staff who work at the International Slavery Museum, and like that's so great that there is specialist um, specialist support for people who have an understanding of racial trauma and you know have specialist ability to to support people who are going through that. So yeah, I think this is a little bugbear of mine. Is a lot of organisations like oh we have an employee assistance program which is very generic. I can I'm a therapist myself. I specialize in racial trauma. Um, I know that the, the therapist world um, and the well-being world generally not great at engaging with anti-racism specifically. So um, that I don't have any faith myself really in kind of generic um, counseling services um, to be able to support people specifically in this area. So I think there's really something that organizations can do at looking at specialist support. Um, also, the other thing that connected to what we were talking about before as well is that the I think I'm really interested in in terms of HR um, and what managing conflict basically you know a lot of what we're talking about whether it's you know people's uh, personal beliefs or whether it's kind of um, difficulties at work it's how how we manage conflict as organizations um, and I was at a talk by Robin um, D'Angelo, um, who wrote um, White Fragility, and she was talking about the different, like in the UK, the culture of niceness versus the culture of kindness. Um, and yeah, and just the, the UK specifically inability to, to really deal with conflict and really talk about it and really engage with it. So part of my research for the um, explore phase was about um, concepts of transformative justice. Um, and I really want to take 
um, those ideas and think about what does that look like and mean for organizations um, within an organizational approach um, in terms of managing conflict. So acknowledging that people are on a journey, um, they might not in intend harm, however harm has been caused. How do we hold people accountable, which isn't punitive, which isn't like you're gonna get a disciplinary, you know, like that's, that's part of why I think there is so much tension because it's like, well, if I say the wrong thing, I'm gonna get in really bad trouble. And it's like, how do we support people to move forward and make change whilst also stay accountable for the harm that they may have caused, um, but in a supportive and kind and empathic way. So yeah, so these are just things I'm just really interested in that I'm learning about all the time, sorry. We, we, we're, um, uh, we're running a bit out of time. Um, um, there was one additional comment, that is the International Council of Archives has launched a new template on vicarious trauma, which can be adapted by employers. Worth a look, so tip. Um, and can I have a very quick stab at the two last questions um, that are on the Slido. So one was, recommendation one is about a space. And um, would space in every organization be more inclusive and ensure that histories of marginalization, slavery, and racism are not siloed? That is exactly the purpose of, um, of the ESSM program. So there will be a, let's, let's call it a hub, you know, it's a, um, 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 a center where, where um, 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 which is specifically dedicated, but the work is across the whole sector, across the whole country. Um, and, and should be indeed in all museum spaces um, in, um, in Scotland. Um, and Sharon Heal, um, thank you Sharon for coming um, up to Edinburgh for this, um, uh, for this day. Um, um, she asked, can we link these new ways of working to sector ethics? The MA is reviewing the code of ethics for museums and how can this great work be tied in? Um, I think this should be a foundational um, principle in in any code of ethics that you know could be devised for museums at this point in time. Um, I'm personally involved in 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 the uh, redesign of the code of ethics from ICOM, um, where also now they're, they're starting to actually draft um, a new code for professional ethics, and um, um, there's a lot of uh, attention for these uh, subjects to be be really strongly embedded in the. Uh, mm -hmm in the codes, um, so um, I would encourage the MA to, um, to, to take this as one of the central principles in the, in the new code. Is that like a proper yes? I see the end yes <laughs> of nodding. See, um, it was my pleasure to announce the next activity, which is lunch. <laughs> so, enjoy. Thank you. Hello, and uh, welcome to today's session on uh, Workforce for the Future. My name is Marcus, I'm the Skills Manager at Museums Galleries Scotland. Um, as a visual descriptor, I'm wearing uh, brown shoes, dark trousers, a white shirt that I could have spent another couple of minutes ironing today, uh, and I've got glasses and I'm six foot six, mid thirties, with a kind of a shaved beard. <laughs> so, I'm really just going to chat you through a bit about the Workforce for the Future project, um, how it came about and why we're doing it. So essentially, um, I won't go through the bullet points there, you can, you can read those, um, but essentially it's about working with a, a school in a lower SIMD area to teach them about 
those employability skills at an early stage um, and those meta skills. So looking at um, you know, presentation, collaboration, um, multiple other things that are very valuable within work, those kind of soft skills and having a museum do that to explain the different jobs that they have there, but also just to, for the museum to act as almost an employability provider to learn more about that. And the session is over six to um, kind of seven weeks, and that can be a split of in the school and in the museum. And there's some pictures there from some of the initial pilots about learning about the different kind of roles and working together to create a legacy. And that legacy could be anything from an audio tour to uh, an exhibition. Um, but it has to be involved some kind of employability and learning about jobs in the sector from a very young, much younger age, so pre-subject choices. It was initially funded um, by the Scottish Government, um, and that was to explore with P5, P6 and P7. Um, and we did that with Sterling Smith, Arbor Signal Tower and HMS Unicorn. And they all produced a different um, resource and a different legacy and a different exhibition uh, that was all attended by their uh, parents and key stakeholders. Um, but what we did see was a massive growth in confidence through every single pupil that was there. Um, and prior to this, the kind of research that we've been doing, especially in the lower SMD areas and the work that we've been doing with schools, we were looking at about 80 or 90 percent of the classes had never been to their local museum. Um, quite a lot of those had never heard of, you know, don't know what a museum is or what they do. Um, so it's kind of in reaction to that. Um, and off the back of the pilot, we got funded again by Art Fund to continue the work, but at a higher level and across more of Scotland. Um, so we do that through kind of P5 to S1 and S2. And we use developing the Young Workforce, which is a national organisation that you'll hear about later on, um, to help identify a school that's in partnership, um, to work in partnership with the museum that is from a particular area that's harder to reach. Um, and each project has funding to help contribute to a legacy. You know, um, pupil-led guided tours, as I said, potentially museum passes, new interactives within museums, but they're not one-off projects. They have to commit to a, a longer um, relationship. So it might be the case the museum have work with them year on year, the museum sign up to Young Persons Guarantee, or the pupils come back in some aspect and work with the museum. Um, the latest iteration of the project um, is through People's Postcode Lottery funding. So the Art Fund is still going on until next year, um, and People's Postcode Lottery is going on simultaneously. And that's at a higher age group, so that's within high schools. So S1 and S2, which is obviously traditionally harder to reach um, for lots of museums. So we use developing young workforce to bring the offering to the schools as opposed to any of the museums going to the schools themselves. Um, and then they help to engage the most effective schools and then bring them into the museum to work across that period of time. Um, we're working across eight local authority areas within the two years, and the main difference between this one, obviously with the higher age group, but we've also created a national um, accessible free learning resource for museums and uh, pupils to use, which Helena will be going over later, and it's called Marzeum. Uh, but I won't give away too much about that, but it's quite exciting. Um, so the ambition is to hit every council area in Scotland, um, and to, for every council area in Scotland to have their own example of working in this way. Um, and for a relationship to be built with DYW um, and this kind of work and working on pre-employability skills, pre-subject choices at an earlier level. So these are the um, outcomes essentially hit by the workforce of the future. So um, arguably it would hit over every single area of the national strategy. So if you're ever wanting to do this kind of work, um, please get in touch. Um, I won't read them all out, but there's a lot of um, really important things there when it comes to demystifying heritage careers or creating more sustainable pathways, which is something that we're really looking, looking to do and something that we've been working on for quite a while. So this is how we got there um, and why we're doing it, I suppose. So in 2018, we ran a program called Skills for Success, which helped 22 non-graduates go through a qualification, work in different museums, um, and help them into jobs within the sector. Uh, off the back of that, we became an SQA accredited centre, so we could deliver our own qualifications. Um, we wanted to show demand for more vocational learning within the sector to help produce a different pathway. And we trained um, assessors um, in the heritage sector so that they could then deliver qualifications within museums and galleries in their own workplace. We did more employability work through the Kickstart scheme, 
We had 55 different places across Scotland. 87% of them went into positive destinations. Half of them went into destinations within the heritage sector. And of those half, none of them had ever worked in the heritage sector before, showing that diversity of skills, really adding value to the employer. Then we ran the pilots off the back of that. So looking at that pre-employability, pre-subject choices, because a lot of the feedback is not knowing about heritage careers. So we've created the qualification you know, that people can do to have an alternative pathway. We've got this new learning resource that you hear about, um, and we're also running these pilots so people can grow their confidence and think more about the vocational aspect of work there as well. Two years ago, we turned the Museum's Gallery Practice Qualification into a modern apprenticeship, so it's now fully funded for anyone to do, no upper age limit. Any staff that want to do that can do it. And we also run a digital marketing modern apprenticeship, and yesterday we got approval to run management um, qualifications as well. So if anyone's ever interested in any of those or want to discuss that any further, get in touch. Um, and from now and going forward, we're going to continue the modern apprenticeship work, continue those different vocational pathways, um, continue the workforce for the future pilots and projects, um, and continue to work more closely with DYW to have more of an impact across Scotland and help people learn about all the diversity of jobs that there are in this amazing sector. Um, but this is the most boring part, so I'll hand over uh, now <laughs> to Megan um, to tell you a bit about one of the pilots that was run, and then after that you hear about the learning resource and um, some of the work that you can get involved in. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, thank you for joining me today. So I'm here to discuss creating opportunities and uh, the project that we ran with Workforce for the Future. Um, and it's all about creating opportunities and how we can guide young people towards um, the completion of uh, projects that leave lasting legacies. Um, and just for a visual description, um, I'm a 29-year-old white woman with blonde <coughs> bleached hair, <laughs> um, a red jumper and a black skirt. Um, so yeah, the project was obviously in partnership with the Scottish Football Museum, which is where I work, um, Museums Gallery Scotland, Developing the Young Workforce Art Fund, and Holybrook Academy, which is a school in a lower SIMD area, um, and it's also working with children that have additional support needs. Um, this button here. <laughs> I'll spring it here. Um, so this is just a little blurb kind of about the project. Um, and basically in today's like, rapidly changing world, it's essential to provide young people with the right opportunities and resources, um, especially when it comes to the world of work and really want to create accessible opportunities um, that empower young people um, and nurture their potential and helps them to de um, develop these valuable transferable skills. So even if it's that they're not going to go on to work in the heritage sector, they have the resources for um, any job really. Um, and working with myself, we had kids come in from the local school um, and take an in-depth look at the job roles that are available within our museum and then kind of any museum basically. So we had a look at the role of my job role, curatorial assistant to curator, to um, visitor attraction manager, tour guide, um, everything really. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of what I cover in that. And we were gonna, the end goal basically is for designing your own trophy interactive. That's what we wanted the kids to do. Um, and it was going to be going into our new refurbished Scot Scottish Cup Gallery exhibition, which is actually just launching in a couple of weeks' time. So that'll be <laughs> great to see. Um, we broke up the project basically to make it more manageable for the children um, and for my own brain as well to organise it. I broke it up into three sections. Um, so we've got here meeting museums, objects and interpretation and Scottish Cup Gallery creation. And this was over uh, 10 sessions that the kids came in to the museum. So none of it was actually done in the um, in kind of teaching and in their school. It was all they would come to us because um, they were incredibly close to the to Hamden, but they'd never actually been, so it was brilliant to have these kids in. Um, it's all, also beneficial beneficial in working with young people with addi additional support needs. Um, as having it all pre-planned and broken up, I was able to send uh, it 
all the kind of stuff, all the information to their teacher beforehand um, to prep them and make them aware of, you know, this is exactly what we'll be doing and make them feel more comfortable in the space when we were coming into. Um, so also a resource that was really handy was, um, I've got here, the Museum for the Future Toolkit, which you can find on the Museums Gallery Scotland website. Um, and they actually recommended to create a kind of like walk through of our museum space and what kind of noises they would hear, what smells they would smell, things they would see, and um, kind of quiet spaces and stuff like that in our museum as well. So that was also really helpful. Um, next slide. So the first section on meeting museums. Um, this kind of covered the first two sections, uh, first two um, days that the kids came into the museum. Um, and it focused on the role and responsibilities of myself and my colleagues in the uh, museum. And the kids absolutely loved it. We created um, basically like a document with just an outline of a person, gave them a couple pens, and I managed to wrangle the curator of the museum, Richard, to come in and be interviewed by the kids. And they could ask them whatever question they wanted. So, um, and they were also kind of drawing Richard and writing round him like what his favourite thing was about working in the museum, um, what qualifications he had, what his favourite colour was, who was his favourite footballer, disagreeing with them about that, who they like more. Um, and then obviously we had our visitor attractions manager, Andy, he was another one, um, and then myself. Um, and yeah, they, they absolutely loved it. And some of the drones, I've not added them in, but some of the drones were really brilliant <laughs> uh, us. Um, so we've done that. Um, objects and interpretation was personally my favorite bit because it's working with the actual collections. Um, and as I say before, these kids had never been in Hamden before. I think for a few of them, they had never been in a museum. Um, and we were taking them behind the scenes to look at our massive collection of uh, trophies, medals, football shirts, footballs. A lot of the kids as well were massive football fans, which helped. <laughs> um, and yeah, they were getting to, we had handling kits um, from, uh, we also do, football memories projects, working with uh, people with dementia. So we had those to hand that they could use them. Um, and there you see a wee guy holding a football shoe. I think he did think it was one that was off display, but that was just a handling kit one. Um, and basically getting to you know pick up the object, what is it? How would you describe it? Write a museum label for it. They didn't even realize they were literally creating a museum exhibition as they were doing it. Um, they got to do a bit of photography as well, photographing the objects. Um, and in the end, we ended up creating a little mini museum. What we'd done, um, to make it more personal to them, I asked each of them to bring in a thing that they loved. It could be anything. So we had a couple, um, a couple people bring in a couple of footballs. Um, someone brought in their personal diary. Someone brought in a little toy car. Someone brought in a comic. And um, they basically had to write down and research five facts or so. Uh, and then I went away and typed them up. They got to take photos of them, and they'd done that as well. So as well doing kind of one for our football objects, they also done it for something that they loved themselves, and they got to then take that and present it to their teacher, which um, they absolutely adored that. So um, let me make sure I've covered everything there, yes. Uh, and then Scottish Cup gallery, gallery creation was then going on to actually look again at the objects in the museum, particularly the trophies. Um, and what kind of material were they made out of? What was kind of engraved on it? If you had a trophy that was for you, if you won a trophy, what would you want it to look like? What material would it be made? It doesn't need to be made out of metal. What metal would you like it to be? Or what kind of material would you want it to be made out of? Really getting them to think about all these kind of design aspects. Um, and yeah, the designs were developed um, for this creative interactive um, and with funding that we received from MGS and the Art Fund, um, we took it to Ronnie, who is an interactive designer, um, and we actually got him to come in one day and see the kids' designs and what they were kind of thinking of and working with them, and then also kind of managed to wrangle him 
um, for the kids asking a few questions about his job <laughs> and um, this kind of different creative career and what skills it is that he has, how did he get into it. Um, so that was another little aspect that I managed to get out of there. And he took their designs away, kind of cleaned them up a little bit, and we ended up making an interactive, which I believe is in the next slide. Yes. There are a couple of videos here, but I don't know if you can play them or not. But this is what they ended up creating. So, oh, they do. Thank you. <laughs> so um, originally, it was just meant to be the kind of game on the left here, which is kind of like a battle style game with all the, so that's all the different kids' designs of what they kind of created. Um, so some really different ones in there, really colorful, which is really what I wanted. So I'm absolutely just buzzing about that. Um, but they ended up creating four games. It was only originally meant to be one, so we we're really happy with that. So it's the really kind of style one, which was the original one, and you can match up the kids' drawings. Um, and then every time you get it wrong, you get a Scottish Cup, um, like football fact, basically. It's also when you get it right, you get a uh, Scottish Cup football fact, but they didn't really realize that. You, you get education either way. <laughs> um, and it was just like a fantastic um, resource that is gonna be in our exhibition space till however long, you know what I mean? It's always there that they can come back and kids, every kid that comes into the museum goes and wants to have a shot of it and play it. Some of the adults as well. I mean, who doesn't love roulette and playing a little bit of snap? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and it's just, we actually haven't had the kids in yet to see it in person. I was just speaking to my manager there, Demi, and I think we are actually gonna be able to get them in next week, so we're really excited for them to actually come in and see it in person. But um, yeah, it's, it's a really good uh, outcome that we, I wasn't really expecting. I was kind of like, oh, maybe I'll just have the one game. But the fact that we've got a few is brilliant. Um, This is a quote from the teacher, um, Joseph Glenn, who uh, was just, I mean, he was a brilliant teacher, gets on so well with the kids and everything like that, and he was kind enough to say this. So just for um, those who aren't able to see it, the Holybrook Academy pupils thor thoroughly enjoyed their time at the Scottish Football Museum, particularly learning about all things football, creating their own football team. We've done that as well, just a little filler thing <laughs> um, to kind of make up time create their own kind of like fantasy football team and their own strips and their own club crests, um, as well as the many accessible careers within the museum sector. Um, I really apologize for the amount of text on here. I kind of just started typing and then didn't stop. Um, so there's quite a lot to look at. Um, but I've just popped down some challenges and successes that I faced throughout the process. Um, let's see if I wrote notes on them here, which I don't know if I did. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I've got, um, as there was quite a quick turnaround from when I was kind of given the project, um, from organizing it to actually running the project. Um, and as we're a smaller char charity organization, although we did have the funding from MGS, um, we were worried about being able to meet the needs of the pupils from Hol Hollybrook. Um, as it's kids with additional support need needs, I just wanted to make sure that they were as comfortable as possible in our museum space and that we had kind of resources there for, um, a lot of the kids had autism and stuff like that, and it is something in our organization that we are discussing constantly and trying to see what kind of changes that we can make. Um, so, um, as I said, one of the kind of resources that I did make was the walkthrough of the museum tour and kind of talking about quiet spaces and everything like that, but I just wanted to try and make it as welcoming as possible, as, as we all do. Um, so that was kind of one of my, my, way, my main worries. Um, and the next point is slightly dragged out. I have wrote that, wrote that in my notes. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about the issue with it being a, a kind of a, a standalone project in the sense that um, without funding, we aren't really able to constantly be doing work with um, local schools. Of, they can come in and visit us and stuff like that, but in terms of like creating an interactive every, um, every year or stuff like that, it's, it's really not within our budget. Um, but, what have I kind of, so, and, and measuring the impact of that, I did feel was kind of difficult because although we have built a really strong relationship with Hollybrook, Hollybrook Academy, we, we can't simply say, oh yeah, just come back again for our 10 sessions and we'll create like another interactive. It's not, um, it's not possible for us at the moment. Um, so it was just trying to measure 
uh, and engage that impact. Um, and then I've got the successes down at the bottom here. Um, as I said, working with Hollybrook Academy has allowed the pupils and the staff of the Scottish Football Museum and Hollybrook to create like quite a, a strong relationship. As I say, we've got them coming back next week um, and their teachers and people at the um, developing young workforce are really excited. We've created like really good relationships with them as well for the future. Um, and the museum, we're a relatively small team. There's only four of us in the curatorial team um, and we don't have any education officers or anything like that, but we're, we're kind of beginning to explore the possibility of delivering these educational workshops and how we can do that with such a small team. So that's um, something that we're definitely looking for in the future, or we'll be looking into in the future. Um, and that's that. Uh, sorry, I've went a bit mental with the text here again. <laughs> a lot of this in there. But it's really important. It's about the impact that the project has had on not just ourselves in the museum, but the Hollybrook pupils, and just about the, just even small things, and like I could see the, the, the difference in the pupils' confidence from day one of when they came into the museum to like the third time they came in. Just they would, oh, they called me Miss Megan, which was lovely. <laughs> um, and just, you know, they would come in and they would like be really friendly with me, and it was really, it was lovely. Um, and towards the end, you could see how excited they were to get into the museum space, and they, it was lovely that they felt comfortable there, um, and they felt confident within themselves of, this is a thing in the museum and I can talk about it and I can create a music, I can create an exhibition and stuff like that about something I love. And so that was brilliant to see um, and expand their knowledge of the history of the collection was, was um, fantastic. Um, and oh yeah, I've kind of put that at the end again there. You can write that. This is some guidance and top tips. I think majority of it pretty much Again, sorry about the amount of text. <laughs> I'm really bad for typing a lot. Um, but it is basically just kind of going over things like if you want to be involved in anything like this, then contact MGS and they'll be able to help out. Marcus is sitting down there buzzing to get going on a new project, I'd imagine. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've kind of put in the middle bit there. We found when working with pupils with additional support needs, breaking up the sessions, this is something I found really helpful, and into smaller fragments was really good for kind of um, making sure that they were comfortable with uh, what they were learning and that it was kind of in little bite-sized pieces, basically, for it, not to overwhelm them, really, um, and having smaller group teachings. So I think at one point we did have about six pupils, which it seems quite a small class, but it was so good because you got, you got to have, like, 10 minutes, maybe even more, with each individual pupil, and I think they really appreciated that. Um, and the next slide. This is just a little, another little quote from a pupil. And I think that's, yes, that's me. Um, so I've got the next person I'm gonna be introducing is Helena Good, who's the director of Dream, uh, Daydream Believer, sorry, but thank you for having me. <laughs> Hello everybody, um, I asked my mum when I sent her a photograph of myself this morning and said I have to describe what I'm wearing and what I look like. My 85 year old mother in, in Ireland said you look like the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Draw your own conclusion. So um, I'm here to tell you a story. Um, it's a story about working with an amazing client who took on board everything that the minister was talking about this morning and has been incredibly brave. I realize that this is the lunchtime slot. So often in uh, conferences, once you've had the lunch, you're sort of, well, what's there to look forward to? So if you're falling asleep, this session and my story is really about you. And we want to hear your story. We want to hear where you sit in this. Because quite simply, we want to hear the yes and. I'm gonna tell you a story about an experience that enables your story, your insights, to now take center stage in the curriculum. No longer be a guest appearance. So if you are slumping, if you are sleeping, I'm encouraging you to wake up because you're coming with me to a whole new planet. Now, this should be signed coming, but... 
Welcome to Marzeum. Marzeum is about the workforce of the future. I was a design lecturer for 26 years, and two and a half years ago, I gave up my job because I could no longer sit in a room and talk about what needed to happen when I knew that I needed to be a how. So Marzeum is a story about daydream believers. Quite simply, we're a not-for-profit organization that take the what and the why, and we make a how. We've built lots of different free classroom-ready resources. I realize at this point, bearing in mind the yes but, that some of you may be sitting there and thinking, yes, Helena, that's all very good, but we've got our own resources. I wish you good luck. Goodbye. And in some ways, what's happened is we haven't moved from primary school where we do this. We're hiding our work. We're protecting it. And quite simply, what we've done is opened up a space for organizations like Lego, Skyscanner, Rockstar, universities, colleges, organizations like yourselves to bring your experience and for us to share it with schools across the world. When we started working with Marcus and Gabby, it was clear from the outset that they were such a brave and amazing client. Because initially, the brief was about the workforce of the future. And we asked them, are you willing for our young people to tell you what the future is? Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Are you up for being brave? And that is the essence of what Marzeum is about. This resource is your takeaway today. This resource is your WhatsApp conversation with a friend, with a colleague. Because every single one of you can take this away and look at the yes and. And that is absolutely a plea from the heart today. We're a small organization. We're a small group of people with big, big dreams. When you download the resource, this is what it looks like. And we often talk about this being the bricks. Our teachers can look at this experience and are looking at this experience and already planning for how this is going to be embedded and delivered in their classrooms in a yes and frame. So what's it about? We cover a lot of this. We look at the future of museums and their purpose. That might make you feel uncomfortable, and it should. We build a museum team. We talk about research, and we forecast the future. But we talk very much about storytelling. This experience aligns directly with a new qualification that we've brought into schools in Scotland, the equivalent of a Nat 5 and a higher, a qualification with no exams, a qualification called creative thinking. We're online in this, our third year of delivery, for over 70 high schools in Scotland to be working on this experience. So we don't envisage this as a warm, fluffy experience. We envisage this as absolutely being the fundamental stepping stone to create the workforce of the future. We align the experience directly with the alignment of that qualification where our young people get an A in failure. As part of a learning outcome, they have to be comfortable with iteration. And that is where our curveball comes in. Incoming transmission. Hello, Earthlings, and welcome to your Marzeum mission briefing. The year is 2050, and a human community is now thriving on Mars. You and your team are tasked with designing an exhibition for the first museum on the Red Planet. 
Marzeum exists to share stories from Earth with young people on Mars and help them connect with humans from their neighboring planet. During your mission, you'll discover the purpose of museums, uncover a story about life on Earth, and think up ideas for exhibits to tell that story. But your journey doesn't end there. Together with a team of museum experts, you'll bring your ideas back down to Earth by launching a live exhibition at a local museum. I'm sending you the details of your mission now. I look forward to seeing what you create. So what you see there is the slide that the teacher uses as a way of briefing and starting this experience. That's part of that downloadable resource. If you're sitting there and you look at that and you get excited about it, if you're sitting there and you're looking and going, I would like to do this, then that, that is the conversations that Marcus and Gabby want to have with you today and after this. We take our young people through lots of stages that will be very familiar to you in a process. They have to discover, learn about museums, refer, research the future, build a team, and analyze their audience. Well, we get them, first of all, to ground into what is their experience of a museum. We ask them to think about a narrative. And again, looking at some of the amazing work in the workshop today with with Lucy around sustainability. This opens up a conversation for that to sit. What is our story? What is our narrative that we want to take in 2050 to a museum on Mars? And where is our responsibility in that experience? We show them weird and wonderful museums, things I never heard about, the Cup Noodle Museum, where you can be a noodle and experience what life is like as a noodle. We get them to question their own predicted vision of what museums are like. And we do an exercise that Gabby is going to be doing with you around the cabinet of curiosities. But it was about the workforce of the future, and it was about opening up the space for people with these skills that we are developing, ability to have confidence, kindness, teamwork, imagination and to see that these were the skills of the future of the heritage sector. We were delighted, and I know that Megan and maybe one or two of you answered that call out to create a TikTok. Anyone who works with young people, and this resource is aimed at sort of age six to 14. They have the attention span of mutes. They often consume content and decide in two to three seconds whether they're going to pause on it. So we challenged you to tell your story of what a day in your life was like in less than two minutes. They explore museum storytelling and get to see museums in a different context. This is about the story of things and think about the relevance of that story in their life. And is that a story that they want to take to another planet? We uncover a story. And again, I know you look at this and understand where this is all leading. They have to think about the story. They have to think about the message. They have to think about the characters, the setting, and the events. And they use that as a framework. So what you're seeing here is an extract from some of the slides that you, as you walk out of here, can download and share with your colleagues. They think about how objects create a collection and tell a story. And we get them to think about that in a really simple way. You have 10 objects. How can you use 10 objects to tell that big story? And what objects are personal to you? And we talk about presenting. We get them to present and tell their idea. We get them to share their vision and evaluate their ideas. When we started building this, we got so excited. We realized that our initial vision of just eight schools was never going to cut it. We're currently working with over 48 schools in Education Scotland in that space. 
And these schools are marooned on a desert island, solar punk island. So we had schools who were saying to us, why did we not get to be part of this? Who chose those schools? So I came back to Marcus and Gabby and said, you know how we said pilot? Can we make it massive? Can we say yes to every school who wants to go and do this? And they bravely said, why not? So we are now in a situation, having only launched this a number of weeks ago, where schools are coming to me and going, yes, we've suspended the timetable for S1s for three weeks, and we're going to run this. The most interesting fact for me about the experience is that the teachers are not coming back and going, is this what you're looking for? They're coming to us and going, oh, we're already doing this. Can you help us find a local museum? And that's what happened in the case of West Calder High School, who are running this with S2 pupils, a history teacher delivering it four hours a week across, across the curriculum. You can understand why Education Scotland are excited about this. This is project-based learning. This is interdisciplinary learning. This is absolutely the future. But we were also aware that one of your yes buts might be your time. All very well, Helena, but I'm kind of busy. There's a lot going on. OK for you, you're a daydreamer. But we wanted to make sure that it was really simple. So your engagement is broken down into three days. And we've mapped that out in the experience. We get our young people to work with you directly, and they bring their story to you. We want to talk to you today about the yes and. If any aspect of the story has resonated with you, what I am saying to you is there is space now in the curriculum for this to sit. And I ask every single one of you to do a really simple thing. The museum, museum resource is on our website. This is what it looks like. You can share the link. You can download it. And I want you to think about one person on your WhatsApp that would be interested in this. It might just be a colleague. It might be you as a parent wanting to get it into your school. But think about that one person and share it. And think about the links that you've got in your all of the different work that you do. And think about how that might sit. This is a story that we hope will travel. This is a story that we truly believe will shine a spotlight on Scotland has been both innovative and brave. This is a story that we believe that you have the seeds that you know in the context of the work that you can, you're doing, that you could do something with this. So we ask you today to be brave, to be innovative, and to move in that yes and, and come and tell us your stories. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna pass you over now to Elma. Sorry. Gabby, Gabby. Hi folks, so if like me, after you saw this learning resource, you're like, why am I not in S1 or S2? Because I really want to do this. Fear not, you can. So um, I'm Gabby, I work in the skills team as Workforce for the Future Project Officer, and I also work with my lovely colleague Sheila on delivering change. Um, and for a visual description, I'm wearing a very uncolorful outfit, head to toe black, um, and I am a white woman, in my late 20s, 30 is feeling closer every day. Um, but we get to embrace our inner child's day by doing the Cabinet of Curiosities activity. So hopefully you will have all been given a worksheet when you came in. If not, Yelena down at the front has some spare ones, so you can always go and grab one there. <laughs> um, so really key to museums, obviously, is a collection. It's how we tell stories um, about the things that are important to us. And what I would like to encourage you to do is to, if you're at home and you're watching this online, either with a plain sheet of paper and a pen, or if you're here with the worksheet that you've got, because all you'll need to take part in this learning experience is a pen and paper, to fill in your Cabinet of Curiosities worksheet. So you're going to have three minutes to quickly come up with a few objects, tell a quick story about it, and then you're going to have the opportunity to share those stories with the people next to you. So I'll pop my timer on. And you don't have to be silent while you're doing this. You can talk. <laughs>
<laughs> There's a curveball coming for you. <laughs> Hopefully you all now have something on your piece of paper. It doesn't have to be perfect. And if you could turn around to someone who's sat near you um, or scoot closer to someone if you're not near anyone, and if you can swap a story about one of your objects from your sheet with each other, that would be great. <laughs> And that is a minute, folks. <laughs> Everyone's having too much fun. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. <laughs> People are having too much fun. I don't know how to get everyone's attention. I'm so sorry to interrupt your amazing conversations. I'm having to shout in the mic <laughs> to try and get your attention. Um, hello, hello. So clearly the learning resource is doing something right because you're all very excited by it, which is great. You'll hopefully all have clocked that there's a QR code on the learning resource, so you can go straight to Marseum and download it from there. But myself and Marcus will be in the hall, so please come and talk to us because we want everyone to do Marseum. Um, and I'm just going to pass over to Elmer, who's going to tell us a little bit about um, developing the young workforce and how that can help you. <laughs> Hello everybody and thanks very much for letting me join you today. Um, I've been away from this type of forum for a wee while so it's lovely to be back. Um, I wasn't aware that I was supposed to do a visual description but my visual description for um, anyone that's interested is that I'm a 62 year old retired woman with dyed blonde hair. Um, I wasn't used to, I didn't used to be blonde um, and I've got a teal or a bluey green cardigan on with a flowery top and my very favourite earrings. So um, I, hope, I hope you're all impressed with them. Um, <clears throat> so my job here today is to talk about um, how to engage with developing the young workforce um, more generally than, than you've heard today um, and what the benefits are to employers from being part of developing the young workforce and something called the Young Persons Guarantee, which is a Scottish government umbrella policy that all the other um, types of work that are in place across Scotland, types of initiatives in place across Scotland to get young people into training, apprenticeships, some kind of employment, volunteering, um, all sits under and it's all about making sure that 100% of young people in Scotland when they're leaving school get some kind of experience that helps them on their way to work. And I am the Deputy Chair of Developing the Young Workforce, and I've been doing that now for about five or six years, and I've been, but I've been involved in the overall programme for about nine or ten years. Um, so, 
As employers and partners, um, and particularly Museums Gallery Scotland, um, we're here as a guest of today, um, play a really vital role in creating opportunities um, for young people um, as they prepare on those first few steps um, into the world of work. And just to tell you a wee bit about that Young Persons Guarantee, um, um, in November last year, we made it much, much easier for um, employers to pledge their support to the Young Persons Guarantee to show that they're interested in helping young people. Um, and it allows young people, as I said, to prepare for the world of work, to allow you as an employer to invest in a skilled workforce, to create a fair and inclusive workforce as well, and to be a champion of young people and the Young Persons Guarantee. What's not to like about all of that? In 2023 alone, over 600 organisations in Scotland pledged their support to the Young Persons Guarantee, and we'd like it to grow every single year. Just a few words about developing the young workforce as well. Um, developing young workforce um, last year, all of the employers that are involved in it delivered over half a million, nearly 550,000 experiences to young people in Scotland. That allowed about 310,000 young people to benefit from those experiences. But that means that for every young person, they're averaging about 1.77 experiences per person. I actually don't believe that that's enough. I think young people need to have more experiences and more opportunities than that to help them see what they might want to do. Um, so while we know that, so we know that as a result of that, that a lot of young people don't actually get any of those experiences because you think about those numbers. So there are, are lots of young people that still can benefit from getting some of those experiences, getting exposure to what um, life may have as an opportunity for them. And actually, those young people that don't benefit from them are probably the ones who could benefit from them the very, very most and are likely to be some of the most vulnerable young people in Scotland. So I'm going to take just a little bit of time um, focusing on the importance of investing in young people um, and preparing them for their, the, the world of work. So this, this slide, um, hopefully people, people can, can read it or see it, but I'll, I'll talk about what's, what's on here just now quite quickly. Um, so basically developing young workforce is about um, helping young people to build networks, um, social capital, um, skills and awareness of who they are and how, how they can interact with work, what that might look for them. Um, We've, we do research to find out and, and we follow through with young people to find out what, you know, what um, gives them a buzz, what excites them, what, what they, they find from these different um, experiences. But a lot of our research shows us that employer experiences in while, while young people are in school um, has a positive impact on exam results. The progression routes that young people take um, after school are much better and that there's evidence to show that the employer experience impacts on their um, earnings potential as well. So again, all good. Um, we did a, a study with seven to 11 year olds. So that's some of the age group that we've been talking about today particularly. Um, and that's shown that even at this age, that young age, um, career aspirations are shaped by their social background and their gender stereotypes. By engaging with employers over a range of different experiences, um, then that has the potential to equalise or, or neutralise that effect. Um, we have also found that um, from more than two thirds of 44 studies that we've done, that, we, that have been undertaken, that employer engagement activities have a positive effect on pupils' later uh, economic outcomes. Um, and each um, participation in a career talk at age 14 to 15, so a slightly older group, is associated with a, a wage premium of nearly 1%. So um, again, just some facts, just some um, hopefully useful information that helps you see how important this is. And the final piece of information that I wanted to give you there was around um, more employer, um, young people who have more employer 
engagement activities are 86%, so it's really high, less likely to be um, young people who don't go into any further education, don't get any employment, and don't, don't manage to get into any kind of training. So getting that, that type of engagement really does help to give young people a solid footing on the next stage of their life journey. Um, for employers' perspective, so that, that's the kind of social needs, um, but uh, from an employer's perspective, um, what does it bring to employers? Um, well, it, there's lots of social and economic reasons for employers to get involved in all of that. I would say that one of the biggest reasons is that it is going to make you feel so good as an employer. Working with young people, being able to help young people take that first positive step on the next stage of their life is one of the best things that any of us can do. Um, but what it does for your organisation is it helps you to tackle skills gaps, ease recruitment pressures. Um, if you're a local employer, and over 90% of employers in Scotland are local employers, then it allows you to feel connected to your own local community and the young people that are living in your local area. Um, it al also allows you to connect with a diverse range of one people, young people. Having worked with young people and engaged with young people for quite a large part of my career, um, there's, there's never any letdown, there's never any downside to it. Young people um, just bring you the most um, wonderful experience when you talk with them and listen to them and you get the benefit of their experience and their views. It can allow young people to go into careers in your section. We've heard that very, very well from the previous speakers and today, uh, to this afternoon's session. Um, and I think, and, and I'll come on to this in a wee minute uh, in a bit more detail, um, it really can um, make a difference to the lives of young people, particularly those who are facing um, the most difficult challenges, the biggest challenges. And it can also motivate your teams as well. You know, whoever else is, is working with in your organisation can get those same benefits from working with young people as well. So how can you get involved? So what's developing the young workforce um, all about? Um, there's a, a kind of a nice map over on, on one side of that screen, the left-hand side of that screen as you're looking at it, which shows you how we're split up across Scotland, how we're organised across Scotland. So... Um, we have 20 regional groups working across Scotland that are made up of um, business, councils, um, people from health boards, colleges, all trying to find ways to help you engage with young people. Um, our network, um, which now includes a developing young workforce coordinator in every um, state secondary school, um, believe it's a team effort to support young people and they really do work as a team. They're really, really creative and they're always, always saying, how can we help? Um, how can we make this happen? Um, <clears throat> I think I said, as what we've heard this afternoon, has already showcased how as collaborators, we can all come together and do some really amazing and incredible things. Um, and we work with thousands of employers across Scotland, but we need to work with more. We need to um, find more ways to work with employers in Scotland. Um, and um, I guess to look at opportunities like Marseum, um, which is just so exciting. Do you not all want to do that? Um, uh, just absolutely enthralled by what I've heard this afternoon. Just so, so, so good. Um, so even if you only have an hour, an hour is really important. Um, if you have a day or a wee bit more time, um, there's many ways to, to get involved and our regional groups are all really happy to, to help, you, help you do that. Um, it's a free service, not a lot um, that's free. It is funded by the Scottish Government, but to all of you it would be free. Um, so, you know, use it. Absolutely use it. Um, the final thing I wanted to say was um, I, I do think that arts and creative services... Um, really break down barriers in a way that some other areas um, don't particularly. Um, it allows young people to be inspired and to be inspiring themselves. Um, and we've heard a lot today about how much it builds confidence. But actually, um, I think the most powerful thing for me is that it really builds confidence and it values those young people in Scotland that need our support and need our help the very, very most, not through any fault of theirs, 
but through circumstances that have been beyond their control. So it is um, really there is so much to feel good about helping these young people and to make these young people an important part of Scotland's future workforce. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, hopefully I've been quick enough, Marcus, and I'll hand back to you. <laughs> I um, just want to say thank you so much for coming to the session. It was really just the start of the conversation, so, you know, get in touch and we'll do some work together. It'd be great. Um, and I want to thank the speakers. Um, you know, thank you so much for doing that. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so I'm just going to leave you on a couple of quotes and then um, I'll tell you where you're going next. So I was up in Oban last week working with Denali Castle. One quote from the pupil that had been there, never been there before, um, when they had to go, leave to go back to the school, said, I never want to leave Denali Castle. So... <laughs> And we went to the Open High School, met with the History Club teacher. Um, he came into the classroom after Gabby met with him for 10 minutes, going over the resource, came in at the classroom and said, we're stopping what we're doing. We're doing this now. Next week, we've got the most exciting project. We're going to be working on it. We're going to Marseille. So come with us on the journey. Um, so upstairs is uh, fair work, and in here is uh, financial resilience. And thank you so much again. Okay, folks, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started with uh, this session. Um, my name is Gordon Morrison. Uh, I'll do a physical description first. Uh, I am a middle-aged man with, I, I used to say greying hair. It's full-on grey hair that I have nowadays. Uh, I have a glorious dad bod, and uh, I am wearing a fake tweed jacket. It's not real, everyone. It's from Primark. There we go. Um, uh, so uh, before we start with the details of the session, uh, we will be using Slido today. Has anyone used it already today? Yeah, so you, you, there might be a good understanding of what this is. If you haven't used it so far, you can scan the QR code. You'll be asked to enter a code. And when you're using Slido, you'll be able to input questions that we will then be able to put to our wonderful expert panel uh, at uh, the end of the session today. We're probably only going to have a couple of questions uh, because we'll be tight for time, but we'll do our best to get through as much as we can. So what is our session today? Uh, our session is uh, financial resilience and collaboration. I would argue this is probably the most prescient session of the day. Of course, I would say that. I'm sharing it. But however... Um, Given the current backdrop of uh, challenges to core funding and um, ever-rising costs, it is more important than ever that uh, museums, galleries and cultural organisations are financially resilient. So in this session, we're going to look at how um, museums can adopt and indeed have adopted enterprising approaches to maximise their income and uh, their commercial returns. Uh, just very quickly, though, I thought it'd be worth me just sharing with you why I am chairing the panel, so who I am and why I'm chairing the panel. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm the, I'm the chief exec of the Association for Cultural Enterprises. Some of you will have heard of us, but not all of you will have heard of us. Um, I, I, I've been the CEO now for just over five months, so I don't, I don't mind saying this. I think we've been a wee bit English-focused in the past. Uh, but you may detect a hint of an Ayrshire accent from me, and I'm determined that our association, which is a UK-wide association, will be far more present in Scotland going forward. So what do we do, and who are we? So we are a charity, uh, as well as the trade association um, that uh, has been around for a long time, founded in 1979. Uh, we have over 450 organisations within our membership, but that represents more than 1,850 venues across all corners of the UK, and we are growing all the time in Scotland, as I mentioned. Um, we essentially, we, we exist to support 
cultural organisations to make money. It's as blunt as that. That is why we exist. Uh, so we're a very practical trade association. We do a lot of education and training for the sector. And just very quickly, what we have, uh, our crown jewel is probably our online uh, uh, and on-demand uh, Cultural Enterprises Academy, which uh, provides more than 40 units of online learning, uh, CPD accredited learning, um, that's completely free to our members. And each, so if, if you undertake, if you, each of your staff undertake that online learning, it's worth about two grand per staff member. Our membership starts at 150 quid, so you can see the value there, folks. Um, but uh, we also, also should say, as a charity, we also offer a lot of our services completely for free for everyone in the sector. We also run uh, an education and training programme, live education and training programme, a conference and trade show. Um, we host awards, we have a job service, and you may have heard of Museum Shop Sunday as well. We are the organisation behind Museum Shop Sunday, which is kind of the antithesis to Black Friday, really. And uh, we also have uh, a Seeds of Change prize fund, a new prize fund to encourage greater sustainability within the sector as well. So that's a quick synopsis of who we are at the Association of Cultural Enterprises. You will then understand why I've been asked to chair a panel on financial resilience, considering that is essentially what we are all about at the association. Uh, we have a brilliant expert panel with us today. Um, who are each going to come onto stage and introduce themselves, but just very quickly, I'll just point them out to you. Just now we've got uh, Lauren, Lo Lauren Rhodes, the Commercial Development Manager at the Behemoth that is Glasgow Life. Uh, and we now, of course, know that the, the new Culture Minister's favourite uh, museum is Kelvin Grove, so that's very interesting. Uh, we, have, uh, we have Thania Flores, uh, who is the H Heritage uh, Environment Resources Officer at the fabulous Trimontium Museum. If you've not been there before, it is a wonderful museum. And we have uh, Melanie Farrell, the CEO at, at the less behemoth-like, I would say, uh, Mary Hill Borough Halls Trust. Again, if you've not been, please go. It's a great panel we've got today, uh, expert panel, as I said, and each panellist has been uh, picked because they have all got stories to tell about being enterprising. So before we delve into our questions, uh, each panellist in turn will come up and tell you a wee bit more about their organisations. I think first up is Melanie. Hi, I'm Melanie Farrow. I'm the CEO of Mary Hill Borough Halls Trust. I'll just give a bit of a quick visual description of myself. Um, I am a short white female uh, with shorter length blonde hair um, that's kind of got a lilac-y sort of tint. We had a discussion about that earlier. And I'm wearing a black, pink, and white patterned dress. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to thank Museums Gallery Scotland for inviting us as the trust along today because we've kind of infiltrated. We're not an accredited museum. So, <laughs> so um, I'd like... <laughs> I just thought I'd get that out of the way before we started. So, um, just going into the presentation now. Uh, the history of the Trust, we were set up in 2004 as a charity to take um, the Beale Acid Victorian building in the northwest of Glasgow um, back into community use. Um, just to bit, give a bit of context, um, the northwest of Glasgow has the same size of population as Dundee. Um, we have um, saved the building and we have, very kindly thanks to Glasgow Life, got back the original stained glass, 10, or 11 panels of the original stained glass into our building. Um, just to say, I've got different things on the, <laughs> the screen from what I'm saying, so I'll try and not put them too, through too quickly. Um, we have also um, uh, got uh, 10 new stained glass panels based on what the community would like to see represented in Mary Hill Borough Halls. Um, we do have a very, very small museum. Uh, we have... Um, that's our beautiful main hall. We have uh, started that back in 2018. We've got a very small collection as well. And uh, we put on a number of different types of exhibitions. So the rotating exhibitions. We also put on, um, so the last, last exhibition we had was a contemporary art exhibition, but we also use um, community generated exhibitions as well. Um, one of our, that's some of our stained glass windows. Um, one of our biggest projects was um, the Maryhill flag. So we're the first urban area in Scotland to have its own flag. This was community generated as well. 
Um, that's just some very interesting graph. It's a museum. Sorry, I'm a bit behind on the slides. Um, so the, the flag was community generated and um, from the design. So we went out to the community and we had people of all ages um, propose designs. We then put that um, out to a public vote as to what design they wanted to take forward. And then this was then put forward to the Court of the Lord Lion to be put in, made into proper flags to be voted on. And finally, the, the one you can see at the very top is the final flag that we've got. We're getting that handed over. I shouldn't actually say this. We're getting handed over officially on May the 6th. Um, Pre-pandemic, oh sorry, that's some of our exhibitions. Some of our exhibitions that we've had throughout the years post-pandemic, um, we work with a local, local artist, Joe Sunshine, who's blind. Um, and so going into the crux of what we're talking about today, income generation. Pre-pandemic, we generated 85% of our income. Um, that 32% of that disappeared overnight, thanks to the pandemic. Um, we worked a social enterprise model. So all the income that we generate, we reinvest in either our programs or the building itself. Going to the, um, thanks to the pandemic, we were able to, I was able to take time out and actually be involved in a number of museum galleries, Scotland uh, programs, including the business support program the steps to sustainability where we um, started working on our uh, development of our shop both online so retail online and on site and also a number of digital programs we are a very i should say at this point we are a very very small team there is three um, main members of staff and two in our cafe so we do not have a huge staff team we have a number of volunteers we've got about 20 volunteers and that's one of our um, employability programmes that we run. So we work with the local schools, colleges and universities to provide work placements. Um, we provide internships paid and unpaid through various universities. And um, we also are part of um, No One Left Behind. So we've um, employed through that kickstart and also paid work placements. In fact, one of our kickstart um, employees is here today. Aurora, she's up there. Um, and. Uh, this has been invaluable to us really through this, this time. Um, and as I said, we started off our community consultation through the, the flag process, but um, after post-pandemic, one of the area, two areas that we went into as for income generation was the cafe and also our shop. So the cafe, we again went out to community consultation to find what the name they wanted. That's the name that was, we, we, we got a number of options put forward that were voted on and then the Nolly was the one that was chosen. For those that don't know, the Nolly, or sorry, Nolly is a term that refers to the canal. So we're close to the canal in Mary Hill and that's what the Nolly refers to. We've just recently completed last year our community consultation which will um, facilitate our business plan that we will be producing over this year for the next three years. Um, and finally, this has got to be the jewel in our crown. This is the most recent exhibition that we have put together. And this is thanks to Aurora out there who, made con who was contacted by um, the son of George Ward, um, Richard. And he said, I've got a few pictures, my dad has. And then as things went on, he said, I've actually got a, bit, a few pieces that he's collected. So we've now got an exhibition with his cameras, his cine camera, we've got cine film, um, and this has just been a huge community engagement tool that has, I don't know, our, our footfall has increased probably about 10 times. Our income and our donations have probably increased, uh, doubled or in some instances tripled. And our new cafe has had a huge um, in, um, increase in generation uh, of income generation as well. So I would like to think that the engagement that we get from this and the community buy-in, which is what we're about. We are a community-led and a community-driven organisation. That This is the start of things to come. But maybe when I start speaking about the other things later on, <laughs> it might be just not so positive. Thanks very much indeed, Melanie. And uh, Fania is going to introduce herself now. Hello everyone, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, my name is Tania Meneses Flores and I'm a Hispanic woman with uh, brown long hair in braids. 
I'm wearing a black uh, sweater with a big button, and my pronouns are she, her. I work at the Trimontium Museum in the Scottish Borders as a Heritage Environment Resources Officer. The Trimontium Museum, if you don't know about it, it's a, it's a wee tiny museum, but we call it Tiny by Mighty. Uh, we have been called a wee gem in the Scottish Borders. So we are an independent trust, a charity, and uh, we are a museum that takes care and looks after the Roman fort of Trimontium in the nearby Newstead village. Uh, we are dedicated to Roman and Iron Age Scotland, and part of our mission is obviously to educate and engage with the very fascinating uh, history of Roman Scotland. Volunteers are at the heart of our organization, and it has been li like that since the beginning of Trimontium. Today we're going to be talking as we, with, with this panel on resilience and collaboration. So that's a museum as it was for 30 years from 1989 to 2019. It was a community museum. It still is a community museum, uh, but it was in very big um, need of a change and an uplift. We didn't have any staff members for all those 30 years. It was always run solely by volunteers until 2020 when we had our first uh, staff member. Then we grew to three, then to five, and now we are eight in between part-time and full-time staff. And this is the redevelopment that we undertook in, um, from 2019 to 2021. We opened in 2021, and yes, that was in the middle of the pandemic, just two months uh, delay, which I think it was not too bad, all things considered. Um, and it in, in involved a major redesign of the gallery, uh, loans from National Museum Scotland and others, uh, great audiovisuals to support the, the collection, and a shop which, uh, f to now, it uh, brings about 40% of our income. Uh, we didn't have a shop before. We kept our walks, we expanded our events, and we increased uh, the ticket prices, which for all those 30 years, it had been two pounds. There was a drama in the trustees when they tried to, to, to raise it to two pounds, to two pounds 25, but now <laughs> we have it at six pounds for those la last two years, and we just raised to seven pounds this year. Uh, how to keep it going after that honeymoon phase of just the reopening and the, re the redevelopment? Well, that was just the beginning phase for us. We always wanted to have a space for education, a space for uh, groups, for tourist groups, for uh, for school groups and a space for our staff to work as well because before that we didn't have any of the spaces so we had last year um, uh, a major um, building of extension for the museum which is this and opened last year and we're still working on this for uh, for this year our goals and objectives for the development and everything has been obviously to have long-term sustainability, uh, to be less dependent on grants, we're working on it, to uh, have support for other projects, more or outreach and education, and to become famous, which we're working on. Um, foster community in the locality, strengthen the locality, strengthen that offer that the Scottish borders in general, Meros in particular, and the south of Scotland uh, have for tourists and for people expand our reach and strengthen our team and always have our mission and vision at the foundation of whatever thing that we do. We also were part of the Steps to Sustainability program and in this case we have some highlights from the program which was always to stay true on mission, on our vision for, um, for what we do for the community, have that growth mindset which is very much at the heart also of what we do, engaging with other organizations and the importance of creating partnerships not only with other museums and other cultural organizations but also with local businesses and with the local community. And we also got tools and techniques from that program that we um, really helped us to, to plan for the future. I'm just going to uh, show you here too. I'm not going to go obviously over the, all of that. That's the path process, which is a planning tool uh, that looks, about, uh, looks to short-term, long-term um, goals as well as uh, dreams and what we have, what we don't have, what skills we have, what can we use, what we need to develop, as well as the purpose-profit matrix, which is um, balancing tool of looking at what are the offers of your museum or institution and what uh, what of those are bringing uh, income, what are not bringing income, what are bringing income and are really close to your mission, what are just close to your mission but not bringing income but that's okay because that's part of your mission and what doesn't really fit to what you're doing. So those were very useful. Uh, we also 
focused on, on planning and on doing market research. We have been doing market research with surveys with, uh, with our visitors, with conversations with our visitors and volunteers, uh, testing the experiences that we're developing for this year, and testing and retesting and getting that feedback. And um, developing skills uh, in our volunteers and in our staff, and also utilizing the skills that are already there that sometimes are hidden talents. We don't know, or you never know who, are, uh, who, uh, who is around you and what the volunteers have to offer, uh, which is always a lot. Uh, exploring the possibilities. That's a major thing for us, which is diversifying the types of engagement that we have, diversifying the volunteering opportunities that we offer so that we can reach more people, finding inspiration everywhere that we look, and also diversifying our marketing. Marketing was a focus for our Steps to Sustainability uh, pro project, and we did a soft launch last year with all of these things that we added uh, or developed or um, push a little bit more, like our social media. We started leaflet distribution, etc. Uh, we started a partnership with Marosavi with ticketing, and we had a marketing mentor through the, through the program. And coming this spring, we're gonna be able to do a bigger launch of our marketing for our Halo experiences, which we are developing. Uh, we have, uh, again, diversifying is kind of the, the topic of my, of my talk, which is um, many different activities that we do for community engagement, as well as for uh, income generation. We do um, a lot of archeological activities, which are free community events and outreach, all that side is free. And we do talks and walks, which we charge for. Workshops are new for us, and we are developing experiences for this year. So our key successes so far has been a Thistle Award from last year for uh, the best visitor attraction in the south of Scotland. Uh, which we are very proud of, uh, major footfall increase and a major income increase as well. Great feedback for our workshops and the testing that we've been doing with volunteers and, and attendees. Uh, raising awareness for the museum, which is a big thing for us. A lot of people don't know about the museum. A lot of people don't know that the Romans even got to Scotland at all. And uh, another thing, the TripAdvisor, we got to number one of 15 things to do, uh, and we were number seven before. So with all of this have been a very big impact in our organization, bringing a lot of confidence, and pushing us to keep delivering, delivering on our programs, delivering on our things that we do. And I think we're becoming more resilient and more sustainable. We haven't gotten there yet, but I think we are in the right track. And that's all for me, thank you. Wow, wow. <laughs> uh, follow that. Lauren, on you go. Hello, um, I'm Lauren Rhodes. Um, I am a white woman in my mid-thirties. Um, I'm wearing a burgundy dress with animals printed in it, uh, on it, um, and uh, I have orange hair. Um, I joined Glasgow Life um, in December 2022, um, heading up the commercial development team. Um, just to let you all know, I'm a little bit of a nervous public speaker, so I do have notes, so do forgive me. Um, so Glasgow Life Museum, so who are we? Um, we are um, part of Glasgow Life, which is an arm's length organisation or ALIO um, of Glasgow City Council. Um, we were formed in 2012 as a charity um, and we manage the arts, culture, sports and tourism offer um, across Glasgow um, through the independent charity and we also have um, a community interest company, Trade in Arm. Um, as a civic museum service, um, a large portion of our funding comes from Glasgow City Council, so we are vulnerable um, to the local authority cuts that we're here, we're here so much about, um, and this is an ongoing concern um, with cuts to staffing and operational budgets. Um, so for me and my team doing a really good job um, is absolutely crucial because we are raising much needed income um, to secure the future of these incredible museums that we are responsible for um, and also, you know, uh, for sort of civic museums leaders having a commercial mindset um, really is sort of in our public duty as well. So these are the sort of seven incredible sites that, uh, that we operate in. Um, so we've got GOMA, um, the Gallery of Modern Art, the Glasgow Museum's Resource Centre, um, which if you've not visited it, it's just outside of Glasgow City Centre. They do free tours of the stores. I'd really recommend it. It's an amazing experience. Um, we've got Kelvin Grove, 
People's Palace and um, Winter Gardens, which has just um, got money for our transformation project, which is very exciting. Um, Riverside Museum, St Mungo Museum and the Art Fund Museum of the Year and the Barrel Collection. So very proud of them all. I don't have a favourite. Um, <laughs> so uh, what we do, um, so we are a small and mighty team in commercial development. I work alongside three colleagues um, and our total headcount, including myself, is 3.4 FTE. Um, we look after commercial development and income generation across all of the museums um, and this is everything that we do. I have to point out that we do not do retail and we don't do catering. I have very amazing colleagues in other departments who manage retail and catering. Um, so we do wet hire and dry hire. The difference is dry hire is literally just someone hiring your space. Um, this is the Riverside Electronic Music Festival. Um, we just hire the event square to them, although we do sit on their project management team. Um, they look after everything and bring their own staff, their own teams. Um, wet hire is when you do things like your gala dinners, conference dinners, fundraisers and things like that. So we look after staffing, we look after catering um, and all their sort of AV needs as well. Uh, we look after filming and photography inquiries. Um, we look after income generating public program development. Uh, we've also developed the travel, trade and tourism products that we offer. Um, and we also support the activities and plans of other departments. Um, so I've been working on pricing strategies for exhibitions um, and uh, supporting our membership and uh, patron scheme um, and looking at how we can increase donations as well. Um, and I've put anything else there because it really is quite random. Um, what comes across your desk sometimes and some of the inquiries you have to deal with. Um, in 2021, uh, my team were responsible for this, um, which is all the world leaders gathered in Kelvin Grove Museum. Um, they really pulled all the stops out. Uh, I wasn't there, but I'm still so proud of them um, because I know that making this event safe and secure an incredible experience would have been a real, real challenge for them. Um, and... Everyone looks kind of happy in that picture, um, kind of. <laughs> um, so how do we make it work? Um, this financial year, we hosted uh, 120 venue hires across all of our museums. So we welcomed 31,000 guests um, to, our, to our museums this year through our events. Um, we've worked really hard on internal relationships and communications. We make sure that we attend the majority of um, meetings that we can. Um, so all of the individual museums programming and content meetings. Uh, we attend weekly management meetings. We communicate every month through our performance reports on what we're doing. Um, and we are also starting to develop um, front of house staff training um, around events awareness um, and management. Um, we focus on solutions. Um, I think that's really key, is trying to find answers and trying to resolve an issue, not just saying no. Um, we lean into the quirky nature of our buildings. We've never changed one of our buildings for an event. They are listed. Um, so we really look after them and we lean into what we've got. So, for example, we've developed events for specific spaces um, and, you know, sell them as a unique experience. For example, the East Court in Kelvin Grove, which is the bit with the heads, if anyone's seen it. We now sell private dinners for that gallery. Um, we embrace um, sort of the ethical considerations, um, so we consider all requests fairly. We make decisions based on a balance of what is best for the museums, for the staff and for the collections. Um, one example of that is I had someone come to me recently um, with a request to have a wedding in Kelvin Grove on Hogmanay, um, which is when we're normally closed. They basically offered us an open-ended budget, um, which you can imagine is super tempting being an events manager, um, but on the balance of it, we felt that it would be a real disservice to the museum and also to our staff. There were real safety and security reasons why we couldn't do that event, so that was something that we did turn down, and that does happen. Um, we annually review our costs um, and our rates. Um, it was really nice to hear you mention price increases because it's also something we're not shy about. Um, Staffing, energy, cleaning, equipment hire, all of our costs are going up. Um, so every year we do increase our prices to protect our profit margins. And we aim for about a 60% profit margin uh, with all costs considered. Um, I've mentioned there The Show Must Go On by Kate Frame. If you are interested in venue hire or developing events at your museum or attraction, I'd really recommend Googling that. Kate Frame was the head of conservation um, at Historic Royal Palaces from 1998 to 2000... No, 
yeah, 2020, um, she was one of the um, first people that I worked with um, in events management, and she's really inspirational. It's just a really great guide. It's free on Google. Um, I'd really recommend reading it um, because I definitely still keep a lot of those values with me. Um, and what we've done to change our approach, so we don't immediately say no to tricky requests. We work with colleagues, share knowledge and experience to make informed decisions. Um, we've done that recently. This is the only image that isn't from Glasgow Museums. This is from Birmingham, but we are having a silent disco at Kelvin Grove Museum this year for the first time ever. Um, and it's because when we had that request, we spoke to colleagues about how we could make it happen. Um, we are also working with our colleagues more closely to work on feedback from events. So we've developed a post-event report um, so our front of house staff can feed back on how things are from their side and so we can make changes to do better. Um, we're outwardly focused, so we are looking always at what other, other people do, other museums and other attractions, um, and also what people are interested in. Um, recently, there's been this huge increase in interest in immersive events, um, for example. Um, so we're always looking at, at other organisations. We're a member of MGS, uh, the Museum Association, ALVA and ASVA, so engaging with our network um, and talking to other people about what they're doing and what their successes are is really important to us. Um, we call it a competitor analysis. Analysis, but I kind of feel like in this sector it's we don't really see each other as competition um, so it's more like sharing ideas which is really nice um, stealing with pride was a term that I adopted um, I heard it at the National Trust down in London um, and I think it's just really good to take an inspiration and ideas from others but making sure that you share the successes um, and thank and acknowledge people for their work um, is really important when they have inspired you um, the proposal process is something we've developed um, to really kind of work on that communication between departments. So if we've got an unusual or a quirky or challenging request, um, I've worked up a sort of a proposal template um, that, that I share with colleagues um, that's really, because it gets everything on paper, everyone can kind of see what is what the impact is going to be. Um, sustainable growth and advocacy at the most senior levels are really important as well and um, talking about the importance of a commercial mindset um, advocating for our teams and the work and the significance of the work that we do um, is really important and um, being sustainable and being able to generate your own income um, is something that you know I've been in the sector for about 10 years now and when I first started people were saying it's never been this difficult the funding landscape and that was sort of 2013 2014 um, and it's even more difficult now, so um, it's not something that's going away. Um, this is something I'm really proud of. Um, so group experiences for the travel trade um, and tourism were introduced by my predecessor, Michelle Woods, just prior to the pandemic. Um, we're now building on this. Um, so we've developed travel trade and tourism packages um, for the sort of the, the three biggest museums that we have Kelvin Grove Riverside and the Burrell Collection we worked with White Stag Tourism Consultancy who are incredible to work with um, and what we've done was uh, we've developed bespoke experiences for the tourist market um, we've got competitive pricing that we've benchmarked against similar um, sized organizations and their offer um, we've developed partnerships with other attractions like the Clydeside Distillery um, and Eek Escape Rooms um, and uh, we're working closely with Glasgow Tourism and Destination Management, uh, Visit Scotland, and the Glasgow Convention Bureau to really make sure that we're maximising um, all the opportunities that business in Glasgow presents. Um, and we've also attended expos. Uh, so the Visit Scotland Connect Expo has been really great to directly meet buyers in the tourism industry. Um, and we've supported international fam trips as well. Um, and looking to the future, um, so... I kind of was going through this presentation, I was like, wow, this really sounds like we're on top of our game. But there's always so much more to do. Um, but also we have to be really realistic. Um, I did obviously mention that my team is 3.4 FTE. Um, it's really not very much um, working across all of those venues. So I have to make sure that, you know, when I'm planning for the future, that we've got sustainable growth built in. And as always, that advocacy with the senior levels of our organisation is so important. Um, culture change and communication um, and ensuring the whole museum services on board with what we're doing. Um, 
this stuff can be quite scary, um, particularly if you've not done it before or if new things are being proposed. Um, there was a, a picture uh, a couple of slides ago of um, a big market that we had at the museums last year, so the tea green markets, they were incredible for us, but people were so nervous about bringing them in because they'd had a bad experience about 15 years prior with markets in the museums. So just making sure that everyone's on board and communicating the reasons why we're doing stuff is so important. Um, and we are looking at a new marketing strategy, um, and I'm about to carry out from the the advocacy that I've been doing over the last year, I've been asked to carry out a full review of venue hire and our commercial filming office offer across all of our Glasgow Life venues, not just museums. So we're really looking at what we can do to generate income for our charity there. Um, and look for the opportunity and be brave. Um, all ties into that sort of don't immediately say no thing, think about what you can do. Um, so thank you. Um, any resources, templates I've mentioned, drop me a line, I can send them to you. I've also typed up my notes as well, and I'm more than happy to send them as well. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Lauren. I could listen to that Glasgow accent all day long. <laughs> really good. Uh, um, okay, uh, I can see some questions already coming in, which is great. Thanks very much, guys. Um, so the topic is financial resilience. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with a few questions of my own to, to each of you. Uh, the, the first question I'd like to put to, to all of you, in fact, a number of questions I'll put to all of you, because you, you can see the variety that we have on stage here. You know, it's at different sizes, different shapes, different types of organization. Um, I don't like to be negative, but I'm going to start with a negative because well, Lauren, you've already mentioned it, the, 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 the difficult environment that we're in just now, the funding environment, rising costs. Um, so what, what are the, 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 the key challenges that you have been facing and indeed that you're still facing just now? Yeah, um, so for us, the, yeah, the rising costs um, and the sort of shrinking profit margins on things is, is a challenge. Um, at the moment, you know, we have increased our prices for the last three years on our venue hire rates um, and also our travel trade um, products. Um, at the moment, we haven't met a huge amount of resistance, but we know obviously at some point that will come. So we are constantly making sure that we're benchmarking um, and looking at what other venues in Glasgow are doing. But we know that our venues are unique and also we know that Kelvin Grove seats more people than any other venue in Glasgow, so that's handy. Um, but it's limiting what we're doing in terms of, you know, I'd really love to develop late night events, um, museum lights, but the cost of our staffing basically makes that either sort of, you know, just about break even or possibly even lose money if we don't sell enough tickets. So there's a huge risk there. Um, and then when you've got, uh, I mean, one of the challenges as well from the cuts is that it's kind of like a, a sort of, you know, you sort of say it as a joke, but it's a bit like Stockholm syndrome, like, you know, that, ha I'm doing free jobs kind of thing. Um, but it really does sometimes feel like that. Um, so, you know, you've got to look at what your capacity is to do as well. Um, so that, that's the biggest challenge. But civic museums, you know, it's a funding crisis um, in civic museums and the next government really need to address it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's interesting, even for a, a large organisation like yourself, that overstretched resources is, a, is, a, is a, a real challenge. Melanie, I would imagine that's a significant challenge for an organisation such as yours. Yeah. Um, I, I actually have written down um, staff recruitment and retention. Um, so post-pandemic, it's a struggle to, to keep people. Um, we've got wonderful members of staff, 20... 20 going into 2021 we didn't actually re officially reopen until 2021 and the turnover as more jobs came available more the, the turnover in staff as, as they move on and especially for a small team so for a small team it's the and, and a small organization so it's costs of recruitment and retention and also the training up and the time that it takes so it's being the core person in the organization it's your time that's taken up with that um, certainly for us with a large Victorian building that was refurbished about 15 years ago, it's the now increasing costs of maintaining and looking after a, a, a large Victorian building with all its little quirks. Um, I think as well that um, everyone's speaking about funding cuts, and it's not just the funding cuts, it's that sort of increased competition and that sort of hunger games, as so, as so we're all sort of when scrambling after the same pots of money. And everyone speaks about um, 
collaboration, partnership working. And, and, and that becomes quite difficult when you're thinking, what's going on over there? Who's going for that pot of money? I mean, we've just been told we're not getting three-year funding this morning, just as I was sitting in here. So, um, yeah, so there's that, that sort of thing as well. Time to, the time that it takes to mobilise projects and, um, and even repairs, so that sort of thing is taking even longer, which then impacts the organisation as well, and chasing workmen and chasing this and, and doing that. There's a lot of things around buildings buildings for us. Um, and board recruitment as well, board recruitment and retention. Um, I'm not sure how other organisations have found it, but it's actually keeping really, really good, good board members or, or finding the skills within your board members. Um, and again, people are finding, just as you're saying, people are finding more demands on their own time with their own, own role. They then can't give the time that a board within that board um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else um, and, and for us as I say it's, it's repair so it's major infrastructure repair so we've just had to put a new boiler into a building which then ties starts tying into your net zero and your your um, if you're wanting to move I think someone mentioned it earlier on today in one of the sessions I was at is that large buildings um, old Victorian buildings that are maybe wanting to move to a net zero or, or it's that initial outlay and although there's there's again it's that chasing the funding there's funding there but it's still not enough to to, to help you do those things um I, I did say i was going to get a bit depressing <laughs> later on um <laughs> and and just as you're saying about the events so we as one of our income generation tools um you um do event hire so um events are not returning um, to the same stage and level as pre-pandemic. So we would have a lot of conference and training events. A lot of training is still being done online. So again, that's still having an impact on us. And the other area that we have as income generation is we have a, lar a large number of office spaces. And of course, everyone has started to downsize and maybe do more hybrid working and working from home. So we have a, a large housing association which had a long, long let. Um, and unfortunately this year we thought, they're going to go, but they've just downsized. Thankfully, I've seen just downsized. At least they're still in the building. So, yeah, there's there's those sorts of things where you are looking at your income generation that's, that's being impacted, but your cost sites are, are going up as well. Sorry to be no, really depressed. Absolutely not. I think everyone in the room will be <laughs> empathising with what you're talking about, to be honest with you. Uh, I promise my next question is going to be more upbeat, guys. We'll get more positive. But, but Thania, just a anything else to add from, from your side? Um, for, for Tom Lundgren, that's out of Scotland. Um, uh, we have a, a problem of awareness of the South of Scotland in general that I think SSDA and other organizations are working towards bringing the South of Scotland more to the forefront of the visitor, especially the international visitor, which tends to go to Edinburgh, Glasgow, the Highlands, and then South borders that basically don't exist. So that's one of the problems that we face. And even though those that get to Melrose, they tend to go in buses very fast to Melrose Abbey, go have lunch and go away. So there's no time for them to even explore the vicinity. We also still depend on grants. We want to get away from that, but we still depend on grants. So we're working towards that, but we still depend on grants and we don't always get the grant. And that's a problem that I think both of you have been talking about. And capacity, that we have a very small staff with very big dreams. So we have all these projects and all these ideas and all these things like, who is going to do that? Like, oh, we don't have time. There's only 24 hours in the day. Um, so that's that's basically the three main problems that we face. I think everyone in the room will, will, will recognise those challenges. I think overstretched resources is something that we've, we've, we've all experienced throughout our careers, but it's only getting more challenging. And it's also quite interesting you're talking about there, Melanie, in relation to um, recruitment, retention, and, and senior recruitment as well. It is a challenging uh, situation out there. Um, okay, let's try and get a wee bit more positive, shall we? Because I think you, you've, you've all given presentations here that, that show uh, some, some real successes within uh, each of your organisations. So um, what have been the wins that you've had that you're most proud of? The things that uh, you're happy to share with the group here, uh, where you've been effective at either um, making money or saving money or good collaborations? Melanie, I'll come to you first on that one. Um, so I think for us, um, a huge, a huge um, win for us um, has certainly been the recent exhibition. Um, so that's that's really about being engaging with our community. I mean, it's only taken us was it 15 years since we've, we've reopened to, to get that sort of engagement and that footfall. Um, but and, and I suppose this doesn't really, and this is where um, you can't put a fin financial price on this but we, we are very much the same as as far as using uh, volunteer 
um, having a lot of volunteers and the programs that we, we put people through and the support that we, we give people. Um, and it's about, um, we're just talking about staff, our team ret ret retention and recruitment. Um, we've got two members of our volunteering team that have come through from work um, placement programs through colleges. Um, one has then stayed with us volunteering, did an apprenticeship, um, and has now been moved into a paid position with Kelvin Grove. So it's the, the pos that is a, I like to see that as a positive within the, the environment is, is seeing that progression. And the other, uh, other person I'm speaking about has started um, as one of our cafe assistants. So it's that thing of, of going into paid employment and it would be so lovely to be able to do more of that um, with some of the more maybe official employability programs. And that's maybe something that we need to, to look at further down the line. Um, but I think uh, for us, it's about, um, with the exhibition we've got at the moment, we will start to explore things that we probably don't do at the moment, um, which is online donations, um, just being a bit more proactive, which doesn't need a lot of staff resource that we can maybe start and then, and then move that on. Um, and things like, um, I was just in a health and wellbeing session, so we've we've had a bit of, of funding around that on on doing health and a lot more sort of health and wellbeing. So reaching out to the networks, so we can. I was talking about collaboration and partnerships, so making use of the networks that we've got and the collaborations and partnerships that we we're doing. And then I hate to say it, but the really boring things of looking at doing things differently with our property management and our facilities management and repairs and all the boring stuff that I was just talking about. <laughs> Dania, you I mean you get so much going on just now. What's what, what are you seeing as the big wins? Uh, yeah, um, well, I, I talked about uh, raising the prices from two pounds to six pounds. I think that was a big win, especially with a board that uh, was very uh, reticent to do that for so many years. Um, our local community engagement and, and buy-in from the community, I think, is a big win, especially in the building of our volunteer base. We have over 60 volunteers plus volunteers overseas that uh, help us with our social media and stuff. So we have been having a really good um, uh, effect and impact there. And our unprecedented marketing investment as well, which was also a very big deal to, to convince the board to put more money into marketing, to, to develop a marketing strategy, to be proactive, not reactive. So those are the three things that raising the ticket prices. The shop as well. Uh, shop was a big thing and our shop manager is always trying to get more stuff and new stuff and the budget people are like, no, no, it's, 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 it's too much. But then the shop brings us 40% of our income and 60% in December. Yeah, great, great. And Lauren? Um, yeah, I think what we're most proud of um, is definitely the work we've done on the travel trade and tourism offer. Um, so in the last year, we've done 128 experiences. Um, we've already got 76 booked for the upcoming financial year. Um, and I think that kind of goes from strength to strength. Um, the tourism market in Scotland is booming at the moment. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're really excited that we can offer people something, um, you know, and, and make some good money for the museums off of that. Um, some of the, the experiences that we offer cost us very little. Um, so, for example, um, you know, all, all of our travel, trade and tourism brochures with all the products are available on our website, so please do have a look at them um, if you're interested. But just one example, our highlights tour uh, with a curator, we charge £45 a head for. Um, and we, get, we regularly book those groups out. So it's, it's really generating some good income for us. Um, Visit Scotland are also a great support on that as well. Um, so do sort of talk to your regional Visit Scotland person about how they can support you with that. Um, also the Tea Green Market. So if you haven't heard of Tea Green events, they do pop-up markets at cultural venues around Scotland. Um, they're an incredible team of people who really want to showcase the best of Scottish makers and artisans. Um, like I said, people were really nervous about this proposal of bringing a market to Kelvin Grove Museum and to the Borough Collection um, because a market had been attempted before, the licence hadn't been granted and it all had to be cancelled at the last minute. So you can imagine that must have been horrendous to be, you know, on the front line for. So I can see why everyone was really scared to do it again. Um, so we just made sure that we presented it in a really clear way. We communicated with our, our colleagues really effectively. We allayed any concerns. If they had concerns that we could act on, like things like we wouldn't have a supplier who was stocked in the shop of that museum for that day. 
we did it. Um, and uh, the Burrell Collection had its busiest weekend ever. Um, so the crowds on the day that we had the tea green market at, at the Burrell Collection even beat the reopening crowds. So we, you know, and so many people saying, I haven't been to the Burrell Collection before, I haven't come since it's been redone. It's like, that's good. You know, it's tapping into an, an audience that might not have visited us otherwise. So that's what we're quite proud of. This that's year. great. That's really, really great. And, and I, th I think it is worth emphasising just quickly that, that yes, there's this backdrop of funding challenges, there is the uh, rising costs, but every forecaster just now is saying that we are going to see record numbers of visitors in the year ahead. So therefore, there is something to be positive about there. Absolutely. I'm conscious that time is, is, is fast running out. So poor chairmanship here. I do apologise. Um, I, I just want to ask, I, I'll ask one, one more question just now. Um, and have a wee look at, and I'll have a wee look at the questions that have come in in, in the meantime. Um, so th this is, I think you've mentioned it already, Lauren, that this is a, a, a collegiate sector that we're in. We, we like to support each other uh, and we, we do share good ideas. So, so where are you finding your inspiration just now? Where are you finding the new ideas? Um, is there anything that you have seen anywhere that you've thought, damn, that's good, I wish we could do that, or we should be doing that? Um, Fania, I'll ask you that first. Um, well, uh, I think we find inspiration everywhere. <laughs> uh, inspiration in, uh, for, for me personally, I have had found lots of inspiration in conferences like this one. I do that, like to attend as many Museum Next uh, online as I possibly can, and a lot of ideas that I have brought to the museum have come from conferences and from seeing what other people are doing. Um, not only uh, museums, but also other things like distilleries or other other places that may be uh, offering something that can be an inspiration. Inspiration from our volunteers and, and uh, staff, and especially volunteers that always have um, good ideas to to share. So for me, it will be like conferences and summits and gatherings like this one, as well as the people that are around you. And sometimes you just have to ask, and then they will go off, whereas maybe they will not tell you if you don't ask. So everybody has a lot of ideas. Great. Thanks. Lauren. Um, yeah, I'm actually uh, wearing something that I am quite jealous that another museum did. Um, so this is a Natural History Museum dress. Um, so Natural History Museum collaborated with Joni Clovin, um, and every year they bring out a new range based on the Natural History Museum, and it is amazing. And I was, I've emailed them to say, if you ever end your relationship with the Natural History Museum, Glasgow Museums has also got some excellent <laughs> patterns. So, um, so yeah, oh, I'd love a little capsule clothing range you know Glasgow's so connected in with fashion and the style mile so um I think that'd be that'd be a dream um but yeah we'll see fantastic yeah, <laughs> Melanie um, so my background is actually um, from arts venues and theatres and visitor attractions so I kind of look out to the wider area not just Scotland but the UK Europe to see what's going on elsewhere um although we're we're in a small part of Glasgow. I don't see why what someone does elsewhere shouldn't be done mm -hmm. where we are. Um, and um, we've started uh, something a bit different with, uh, th thanks to Visit Scotland, we got some funding to tell the story of Mary Hill um, through storytelling. And um, we are now making a comic book out of what we are I'm still engaging with audiences. So we're just trying to do a, something a bit different to try and engage with maybe audiences which are young, younger people that probably wouldn't engage with, with, with heritage. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. And just look at the community consultation and see what the community actually want because we, we're a very diverse community. So they'll have lots of different ideas for what we can potentially do as well. And, and partnership and collaboration with the local networks as well. No, that's, that's absolutely great. You've got, we've got to applause, uh, um, applaud that, that enter enterprising spirit, absolutely. Um, I think we are out of time. We've got one minute. <laughs> okay. uh, I, so there was, there was actually one question, that, if you don't mind, just take one second. Just to say, you know, there was a question that came in that said, uh, as a small volunteer museum, are there uh, funding things that we can do that don't cost lots of money and time? Uh, that's, I mean, that's a killer question. It has to be said. You know, Crowdfunding, potentially? Would that be one of the things you'd look um, at? Can I just come in on that? That exhibition that I just put up for the George Ward exhibition, that cost us £300. Wow, OK. <laughs> Anyone else? Any uh, comments to make on that? It's a challenging question. I know you've hey, got about four really, seconds to answer. Hey, it's really difficult. <laughs> I think, like, look, look at what you are happy to monetise. Um, you know, can you charge for tours? If you're not happy charging, can you, like, highlight your 
you know, your charitable objective, what you actually do and the significance of your museum at the end of experiences and, and ask for donations. Um, you know, making the ask is something that I've really noticed you know, we don't always actively do. People really care about their museums, and you know, you've seen with like the threats and closures, closures threatened, um, particularly down in England. Um, people don't want to lose these assets, but often they don't even know about the challenges that we're facing. So actually, talking about them and, and owning that, like it's not our fault. We're doing the best we can, and we really need help from our, our communities and the people that we serve if they can. So, you know, I don't think there's any shame in, in being commercial or asking for donations or for support because people really care about these places. They're so vital to the fabric of our communities. So, um, talk about that, you know, that's what I would say. Great. Thanks very much, Adila. I think we are completely out of time. So, <laughs> can I just, uh, hopefully, that's been inspir I found that pretty inspirational. These are three very inspirational figures. Can we all give them a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, we are staying in this room, as I understand it, for the plenary session starting in just over five minutes on the future focus. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, we could. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everybody. You have made it to the final session. You have 25 minutes to go, and then you can all go into the museum and have a wander around. Um, I'm joined here today by uh, my fellow board members. I am Patsy Convery. I'm a board member of Museum Gallery Scotland, and I'm also head of marketing and communications for National Museums Scotland. Um, we, I am a white, uh, unfortunately middle-aged woman with light brown bobbed hair, and I'm wearing a pink satin blouse. Um, in a moment, I'm passed down my line of fellow board members who, and we've been tasked today to talk about, Siri's talking to me, um, about our key takeaways from all the presentations that we've heard today. I'm sure you'll agree, we've heard a huge amount and a lot of thought-provoking, inspiring presentations um, that we'll all take away. And what we are interested to talk about is not only what we'll take away from our perspective as board members for MGS, but also from our perspective in our day-to-day -day jobs in the sector as well, because we are facing so many challenges at the moment. We're very brutally aware of that. And we've heard um, best practice today, haven't we? We've, we've seen some amazing showcases and case studies and examples of best practice in the sector that I'm sure has inspired us all against this backdrop of the many, many challenges that we face. Um, one of my, because I was, I've been in the auditorium all day today, and um, one of the, I, I was really struck by the first session on transformational change and meaningful action this morning. Um, and I know many of you were too, just by the conversations I've had at lunch and at the coffee break. Um, I was really struck by Ellie from NLS and the work she's doing um, about diversifying um, the workforce there and the cultural change that's needed. Um, not only to happen to, to change the workforce diversity, but also to ensure that those involved are supported, that they're nurtured and obviously retained um, moving forward. And thanks to Helena from uh, Daydream Believers and the Marzeum Project. I've learned there's a noodle museum in Japan. <laughs> I, a sentence I didn't expect to say today, um, but there you go. Um, developing young workforce um, for the sector, that was a great initiative that we've also heard about this afternoon and the opportunities for young people within all our museums and galleries. And then on to financial resilience, um, a topic that is very, very close to our hearts at the moment. And um, there was a keen reminder in that session just there of the power and importance and the opportunities that lie within our communities and the importance of that. And this connects very nicely back, obviously, to the strategy that we're here today to and looking at. Um, so that's my key takeaways as I kick off, and I'm going to pass down to my colleague, Matthew. Good afternoon. Hello, my name's Matthew Bellhouse Moran. I am a white um, man in my early 30s. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I have short brown hair. I'm wearing a, an ambiguously brown jumper. Uh, I have glasses and a questionable mustache. Um, so my takeaway from today, um, well, the thing that I found um, the, the most 
heartening, but also the most in, uh, most challenging in a way because of the scale of the challenge that's starting to emerge is the, the transformative change and meaningful action strand this morning um, in the auditorium, the, the session on inclusion. And um, having listened to the speakers and the work that they're doing and the work that's been going on for some time, I can see that the sector is moving towards um, a self-awareness and understanding of its failures and shortcomings, which to me is the first stage to meaningful change. I don't think that we can look at the amazing work that's being done and has been done over the last couple of years and think, well, this is all going to be fine, this is sorted. But I do think that there is starting to creep through the sector now um, a self-analysis and an awareness, and that is an unpleasant task. It's not nice to be self-critical, but I, I'm really pleased to see that uh, a lot of organisations in the sector are doing that. And it seems that um, compared with what we were talking about in forums like this five or ten years ago, the conversations are completely different. Um, we've, we've moved on from how can we get more visitors, uh, how can we attract more visitors, to how can we welcome everybody and make everybody feel that they're a stakeholder in their museum, which is really interesting. Um, and I think... The years of fantastic work that has been done, the um, project work, but also the sustainable practice work, I feel is building up into something approaching a, a groundswell, where I, I feel like um, this has a long way to go, but um, it's not going to stop, which is, is fantastic. And it's work that will never be finished. That's the other thing to remember. Um, but then linking back to this, I think um, that with the session that we've just had about um, financial resilience and sustainability and, and how you could increase your, your revenue. I wonder to what extent um, these pressures are mounting on museums as we have to be there for everybody. We have to have a purpose for everybody. People vote with their feet and people don't go to a museum to see history. They go to a museum to learn about themselves and see themselves in their museums. And that also extends not just to visitors through the door, but additional spend and the money that people spend and the patronage that they will give. And I feel like this is where um, funders and stakeholders are now correctly demanding that their communities be represented at every stage of their museum experience, which I think is very important. So those are the takeaways that um, I have had. Mike. And I'll pass on to Mike, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you all awake still? Um, thank you, Matthew. That was... Uh... Long. No, no. I... <laughs> yeah. No, it was... No, I agree with every word. I agree with every word. So, hello. I, I'm Mike Benson. I'm a new board member for MGS, which I'm really looking forward to doing. I'm also the director at the Scottish Cranach Centre. I am a white male, uh, not far off retiring now. Um, wearing well, wearing grey hair and, and a dark Fred Perry top that still looks cool, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, it's it's been a it's been an interesting day. I've I've been really busy. For those that don't know, we're building a new museum, and today has been brilliant because it's reconnected to me of why we're building that new museum, and I think that's my biggest takeaway of today is actually being able to come and be with you guys and feel part of something bigger than myself. So that's, that's, that's been fantastic. I think there's a momentum growing, which I think everybody will, will, will talk about a little bit. I thought Sheila's phrase um, that the work that we've got to do in the next 10 years isn't more work, it's just working differently. And I really like that. Um, I, think the, I think, again, Ellie, with, with a personalised approach to... It, it's all about people all the way through. It's all about the person. You know, quite often we talk about communities, we talk about audiences. In the end, it's about people and, and, and wrapping around those, th those folks. So I thought that was, uh, I've took that away as well from s some people, some good learning for me there. Maybe 10 years ago, more than that, maybe I, I, I was asked to speak at a MA conference um, and I talked about, instead of museums changing people's lives, people's lives might start changing museums. And I've got a real sense of that today, um, which filled me with a, a great deal of joy and optimism and the energy to, to drive on and keep on going. 
I had a judder of judderness um, when, when, when one of the questions came back around, uh, somebody had said that the director didn't quite understand the value of some of the work that was going on. So clearly there's a lot of work to do and, and, and there's a lot of work to do around leadership still, or the leaders, um, and understanding what leadership is. Um, and it doesn't sit at the top, leadership runs right through. Um, but yeah, that's me. I'd, I'd just uh, just like to thank everybody for organising this and uh, filling me full of optimism again. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to pass on to a beer. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I totally agree. There is very little now for me to say because <laughs> 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 not, not I literally sat in the wrong seat. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abir El Adani. Uh, I am um, Accutorial Assistant at the uh, University of Aberdeen Museums and Special Collections. I'm also also a new board member. I haven't actually attended my first meeting yet, uh, and, and I'm here sitting <laughs> uh, on the panel. So. Um, what a fantastic day, wasn't it? It is amazing. I have had um, a really brain workout today uh, from starting by the minister's uh, speech. Um, she talked a lot about being relevant and I think this is something that I will certainly uh, take away from today. Uh, there was also talk about collaborations uh, and I, I have um, some, I, I do love collaborations, uh, but I have some concerns about collaboration. Sometimes collaborations end up with um, the top, but actually doesn't filter through the system. And I think maybe we should look at that. And actually, I do like to work with people outside my organization because it is fun and they are my colleagues and, and, and we like to exchange ideas. And it's not just in these events such as this, but actually, also in, in smaller projects, and I, I do like that. I don't know about you, but. There was also brave, which uh, makes me slightly scared. We have to be brave, but we have been brave. We have been brave a lot. Um, I'm very optimistic, if you know me, and, and I'm very, I, I come out today also very optimistic that we are really going in the right direction. We are really going in the right track. We are developing, and as Matthew said, that a um, few years ago, the conversation would have been very different. The conversation would have been about the visitors, but now we are really looking it with very um, new lens at the sector that we are working on. Um, something else um, regarding the fair work, um, session that we had uh, just now, uh, and this is something that I will certainly uh, consider, uh, is to have um, a well-being budget uh, for, 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 for the team. I think this is a wonderful uh, idea, and also to have um, the mental health first aid training available. Uh, I have been trained, my organization trained me for mental health first aid, and I think this is something that really has to be available for the sector. I think I've talked more than the two minutes, sorry. I, I think this is, <laughs> this is everything from me, but uh, certainly um, there is a lot. There is a lot to take uh, from today and I um, have enjoyed every single session. So thank you very much. Um, Abir, you just brought up a really good question about what you will take, actually take away from today. And I'm going to put Mike and Matthew on the spot about if there's anything actually you will um, follow up from, from today that you will take back to your day job. Thank you. I think um, just to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> it's definitely uh, it's really interesting to see those methods of work that you come to by trial and error in a small museum. So, for context, I'm the museum director of HMS Unicorn, and we have three full-time staff, and we run a very large wooden ship. And all that it wants to do is be at the bottom of the dock, and it's my <laughs> job to <laughs> stop it. Um, and when I come to uh, sessions like this, there's all those moments you go, oh yeah, no, we, we got there as well, but by trial and error, and it took a lot longer. And there's the element of frustration of, oh, I wish, I wish someone had just told me. But then there's also the reassurance that your own faculty and your own ability to work through a process with you know, things like the strategy to guide you um, brings you the same conclusion. So I've seen parallels with the work that we've done 
um, at Unicorn th throughout today, which is which is fantastic. And there's just been moments we've gone, that is so similar to what we do, um, especially uh, some of the stuff that was happening at Abbotsford as well um, in the uh, uh, second workshop today, Connection, Health and Wellbeing. There were just, it's, it's like um, the speaker and my learning officer um, were commuting telepathically. <laughs> and it, it's clearly because this is a, with specified outcomes and specified ethics, there are ways to do things in a more efficient way. And we are all discovering them around about the same time. And that then leads on to connection and collaboration, which is if we are just a bit more consistent at it. I was looking at this thinking, I could have saved myself so much time and hard work if I'd had the right conversation with the right people, which is what I try to do, but there aren't enough hours in the day. So it's definitely um, connection and collab collaboration I came away with today. Okay, that's excellent. And Mike, go back to the Scottish Cranach Centre. I think for, for, for me, I think it's, it's, it's simply that there is more work to be done, and I think within this room and everywhere else, I think we can do it. Well, that's one way to finish, isn't it? <laughs> well, let's, let's just get back to work. <laughs> I think that's all we have to say. Lucy, and it's over to you for final words. It's all right, I'm not going to make another speech. I'm only coming here so that you can hear me. Um, <laughs> listen, um, I think you've summed it all up brilliantly, all of you, and, and it's that sense of full brain at the end of a day like this. Um, but that also that sense of optimism, and I think that's come across really strongly today. So I'm really grateful to everybody who has brought their ideas, their energy today, I would say thank you. It's, it's brilliant working with, um, we've got a brilliant board at MGS and we're really lucky to have all these different perspectives from different parts of the sector as well as people from outside of the sector who make up the MGS board. So we're really grateful to them. But I'm grateful to all of the speakers um, who I say have brought their ideas and shared that experience because it is absolutely, as you say, Matthew, what we, the, the knowledge, the way to do that, we've all got these lessons, um, things that we can share. So please think of MGS, we're your national development body. Please think of us as, as a resource. Please tell us where your good practice is. Please ask us the questions that you need. If we can maybe have that facilitating role of joining people up, if we've got that awareness of what's going on, um, then we're able to do that. So keep the feedback coming. I know I've been asked to say, some of you took feedback cards away to fill in. There will be a place to put them on the way out as you go out. So please do keep that, um, that feedback coming. Um, I think my final thanks for the day go to the, um, the brilliant venue team here at NMS, but also to my team at MGS who've done a brilliant job in, in putting um, the event to, to today together, whichever order of words um, we want to go through with that. So, yeah, um, thank you for making the time to come today. Thank you to everyone who's joined us online as well. I hope that you've got a lot out of today. The museum is open till five. So I would say go and enjoy it, uh, and just, or even it's just to sit and reflect on, on all you've learned today. Um, it's been brilliant, uh, so thank you, and good uh, onward journeys. Thank you. <laughs>